Hello and welcome to the Cuyamunga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Cuyamunga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational uh, institution, we recognize the thrive we must take an open approach. So we invite scholars of parallel research and related fields to help broaden the scope of our work and exploration. That's why we call it Conversation for Exploration. On these Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics, uh, including neuroscience and mysticism, trance states, anthropology, art history, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, shamanism, mythology, and much, much more. You're welcome to visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, of course, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we thank you, the community members who have continued to support the mission of the Cuyamunga Institute. Today, we have invited a special guest. I, I'm going to say actually a friend who's joined us at the Institute several times for our in-residence programs we hold. And we've had the pleasure of spending time together also in Munich with Brigitte. Um, so wanted to say that we've had kind of a fun relationship because Brigitte comes to the Institute and we have this ritual that we do each morning. We wake up and those of us that are up at early, almost, almost 100% of us, we climb up to the top of the hill and we greet the sun each day. This was established by <laughs> Felicitas Goodman when she, when she uh, uh, led her workshops and so we follow in her footsteps. And so we go up to the top of the ridge, and the New Mexico sunrise is really quite magical. It's just absolutely uh, uh, out of this world. And so we watch the sun come up, and, and we have a little ritual of greeting the sun. And after we greet the sun, all the people that have joined us, we say, hey, do you have a, a story to tell or a poem to share or something to share? And each person goes around and shares something that they feel. And Brigitte comes, and she says, you know, I know how to yodel. Should I yodel? So, well, absolutely, the mountains of here would love to hear the sister songs. <laughs> they, want, they, want, they want to hear these. these from uh, the Alps. From the Alps, yeah, absolutely. And so Brigitte just opens up, and it's just it's this beautiful, wonderful, uh, exciting thing that we did at the Institute. And so she came back several years and continued to be the star on the hill doing the, doing the, uh, the, uh, the calling to the mountains. So uh, we're really pleased to have her here today. Brigitte Veit. Uh, the, yeah, we spent time with Brigitte in Munich when we were there to present this work, and uh, we had a lovely dinner with her oh, yeah. at the home of Thomas Otten and our, our cousins of our good friend Barbara. Yeah. And uh, Brigitte, you, you relayed this beautiful research that you've done on the history of Oktoberfest, That's and right. it was just fascinating. We, of course, are very interested in the deep, deep history of rituals going back through time and how they revitalize for today, how we still carry on in a more secular fashion, I think with this kind of ancestral memory bubbling up that informs the uh, the rites and the, the rituals and the songs. And you have detailed all this for Oktoberfest. Uh, you join us from Munich. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Well, we have to at first establish the long, long history of beer because Oktoberfest is all about the beer. And uh, it has such a long, Modern interesting day. history. Yeah. yeah. So um, always a goddess associated with it. From the ancient Sumerians of 4,000, 5,000 years ago, Ninkasi, long hymns that were written on their cuneiform tablets outlining the many steps of brewing as a recitation for the goddess to bless it. Um, it's, it's such a long, long history. And I know that uh, Mark Plotkin, a bioprospector in the Amazon forest, was telling us, uh, that interview's posted, by the way, um, that a lot of societies make beer or some mild alcoholic beverage that everybody drinks because the water is so full of biomass that it would be uh, poisonous to them. So they have to do something to purify the water. Mm -hmm. And you can read in even medieval times that 
uh, there's old recipes that people have tried today where they took scummy pond water and through the brewing process it was purified enough to drink and they were amazed at what the fermentation process creating alcohol as a sterilization can do to make potable beverages uh, for a community. So such a long history. Tell us, uh, what, Paul, do you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say, I picked up a couple notes. I said, let's look at the history of beer. In what is today Iran, ancient pottery jars revealed that beer was produced as far back as 7,000 years ago. You already mentioned the Sumerian tablets depicting people consuming a drink, 6,000-year-old tablets, showing that they're, and drink, recipes. And that, they're drinking through reed yeah. straws out of a communal bowl. China residue of pottery dating back about 5,000 years ago shows beer was brewed using barley and other grains. The earliest archaeological evidence of fermentation consists of 13,000-year-old residue of a beer in Carmel Mountains in Israel. And that was about how old grain cultivation is, about 13,000 years. So, I mean, it doesn't take much to get grain uh, started. So they were making beer and bread, bread yeah, and beer, right. same hand grains. Hand, right. And it was part of the preservation of the grain through the winter process, mm. bread anyway. And ancient so. Egyptians first documented the brewing process on papyrus scrolls about 5,000 years ago. And here in the US, the Discovery Channel put together a program called How Beer Saved the World. Oh, wow. And they said, did you know that beer was critical for the birth of civilization? Scientists and historians line up to tell amazing untold stories of how beer helped create math, poetry, pyramids, modern medicine, labor laws of America. Deserving et cetera, of a goddess. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I'm not promoting that, that film, but if you can find it, good luck. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so anyway, back to Brigida. Thank you so, so much. I just thought that would be fun to throw that in to start the story so, because when, a you long, say, long history. when you say Oktoberfest, people follow up with the word beer. It's all in the same sentence. Well, why don't you take us back to the beginning and tell us the real story and what's going on? Well, I want to ask you, how did you yeah, get you involved with uh, this whole your research, body of yeah. research? What was your mission? You're a dramaturgist, so you look a lot into theater and the plays. You're a psychotherapist, counselor, and uh, you were the maven of Oktoberfest, helping to kick off the festivities. So tell us how you got started and what you do. Well, the thing is, I am always, have always been interested in human drama in a way, things that happen to people, exciting situations, and I've been studying theater and writing plays. And I was not born in Munich. I'm born in Bavaria, but in the north part of it. And when I moved, actually, I lived in the United States for some time and studied there. And when I came back to Germany, I moved to Munich, and I moved very close to the Oktoberfest. That means I live only one block away, actually. It's around the corner now. I st I'm still in the same spot. So I could walk there in five minutes and I was so excited by, I mean, I'd seen it before, but with the point of view of being a drama person, I thought this is the biggest theater I've ever seen. You know, the people, they're happy, they're merry, they get drunk, they get crazy, they have fun, they have fights, they have everything. And I thought, this is fantastic. And I started diving into this for like 29 years now. I've been going to the Oktoberfest, like each time it's on, and it's on for 16 days. And sometimes I managed actually 16 days of going there and watching people and making notes and seeing what's happening. And it's the biggest folks fest in the world in a way that it's of its size. And I was so fascinated by the tremendous input of different people from all different countries of the world. And just the, my excitement about this carried me there and started making writing about it. And I always loved folk fairs as a kid. I mean, I just love country fairs and stuff like this. So it's been in my blood from the beginning. You know, it's interesting how much Europe celebrates um, small country folk festivals. And there's always a wild element, it seems to me, from what I've seen, and where people dress up in kind of a version of the wild man or nature spirits and parade through the streets. Um, tell me, I, I think that... This is such a revival of, again, a very ancient festival that is finding uh, its continuation to modern times. But can you give us a little overview of the whole folk festival mission and well, uh, fertility yeah, rites? What are they? The Oktoberfest itself is, also has the, the biggest parade in the world of, of traditional costumes. So on the first Sunday, the Oktoberfest starts, they have this tremendous parade, which lasts like three and a half or four hours, almost through the whole city. 
and people are invited from all the German uh, counties and traditions with their costumes and colors. <clears throat> and even from all of Europe, people came from Spain to Bulgaria, to Russia to, to join this parade. And then they show off all these costumes that they have. So the tradition is very strong. People show their ancient uh, costumes, head dresses and whatever they have. And so there's a great pride in this tradition. Uh, and the Oktoberfest feeds this pride, of course. They, they want to make it more, you know, so people enjoy this. Um, there are folk fests, but they have more these wild kind of characters. This is more in the mountains mm -hmm. and it's more related to winter times usually. Uh, in the Oktoberfest, it's more like the music and the rhythm and the umpa bands, you might call this, and the folklore that's there. But it's wild in a way. It has a wild thing because it has to do with fertility. That's true. When we look at some of the ancient artifacts that we use in our work, and Sekhmet in particular mm. had a beer festival for ancient Egypt, and it was about the mythology of taming the wild Sekhmet as she was going through um, issuing justice and bloodying humankind because they weren't following the laws and the rituals. And she was tamed by adding pomegranate juice to stain the beer red so she would think it was blood and get drunk and then sate herself yeah. and calm down. So such a long history All of taming of the wild um, within but or letting it out periodically. I think mm -hmm. that's so fascinating. And so you as a psychologist, I'm particularly interested in your take on the um, communal psychological benefits of ritual. If we start talking about beer at this point or the wild part of the Oktoberfest, it needs to be uh, said that in old times in Germany, in the old Celts and the pre-Christian times, they made beer out of honey, this meat kind of drink and the, the Celts had kind of an intoxicating drink. And the beer, even up to 1517, was mixed with psychedelic substances. Ah, interesting. Ah, see what I mean? And so the beer in old times, first of all, it was related to women. It was related to goddesses because it comes from the field. It's a grain, mm -hmm. you know, it's barley or wheat or whatever you use. It's, uh, it's related to the grain goddesses and the harvest goddesses. And beer used to be made by women. Even in old Egypt and Babylon, the beer was made by women. Interesting. And also the same thing in the Celtic here. And they used for different festivals, different intoxicating substances. So they would put in like the red mushroom kind of type, you know, the mushrooms with the red cap. Anamida muscaria. Psychedelic, yeah. you know. And they have something that's called tolkush. It's the wild cherry that's really highly intoxicating. If you eat too much, you could die from this. So they mm. put part of this in there. And you maybe know the famous Pilsen beer. People who love beer, they know the Pilsen from Czechia. Oh. Actually, the Pilsen beer comes from a plant that's called the Pilsen kraut. It's a plant, it's a herb, it's a built in herb. And it's a highly psychedelic fruit, a black kind of uh, little cherry type thing. And they used to put this in the beer. And this is why the beer is called that way. Huh, so the beer used to have psychedelic, um, ecstatic kind of uh, qualities. But of course, the Catholic Church did not go along with this. The Oktoberfest would be completely different if they kept this kind of thing. But <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. But it's interesting. Go ahead. The yeah. Bavarians are very proud of their first beer law of the purity law of beer was set out in 1517. And they pride themselves that in the beers only barley and wheat and hops and not all, not, nothing else. But in fact, the first the purity law of beer was the first anti drug law in the world. Because oh. they prohibited psychedelic drugs in the beer. So the beer could not be made anymore with the bills and crowd and the herbs and the stuff and the mushrooms. So they had to take the hops and the hops makes you tired. And people are tired. They won't put up a revolution, right? So the oh, beer, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so the beer was constructed in a way that it couldn't have a psychedelic quality anymore. And the hops, uh, for one thing, I don't drink beer too much myself because I get really tired. I, I'm not getting like mm -hmm. flying around the, the area it's more like the beer makes you tired and more depressed and where you sit and you get more tired all the time <clears throat> and this is a wanted effect they wanted this i see yeah I, I, so this is what what the truth is control, about the beer control of yeah. the masses as yes, well as yes, celebrating yes. the masses oh interesting mm, wow yeah i have very low alcohol tolerance so i can sip a little bit but i do it because it's so interesting it's got such mm -hmm. a beautiful history and mm. so the microbrew varieties are, are a revival of the different additives, psychedelics notwithstanding. 
So there's a book of recipes with these things. If you want it, I have it here. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. A lot of home brewers out there today. Yeah, yeah. So, that's right. That's yeah. right. And coming back to your personal history, then you decided not not only just to live near the Oktoberfest, you started, you took this on as a study, as a, as a research project, and part of your educational uh, degrees. I mean, this is something that you took very seriously. And how did yes, you do all the research you did? Yeah. Well, well the, the, my research for the Oktoberfest, and the outcome was this book here. This is what, this is my thesis on the October, in the Bavarian blue colors here. This was my, like, diploma thesis in psychology at the University of Munich. Uh, the thing is, it's a mixture of all my private uh, kind of experience. And I took it on to the university and said, listen, I want to write about the Oktoberfest. And they said, nobody ever did this before as a psychologist. And I said, it's great, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> New ground, it's perfect. And the, the thing is that I, I didn't meet all the way excitement because some professors told me, you never get a job in a clinic if you write about a thing like that. And I said, well, I don't want a job in a clinic. That's it. I mean, I'm going to be freelancing psychologist. I can write whatever I like. I'm not going to write about depression. I'm going to write about a fun festival and see what people do there. And it's the study ground for social psychologists. There's nothing better than this. Yeah. And I finally found one professor who was willing to do this with me. And I tell you what, the guy never went to Oktoberfest with me. He never went there. He hates it. But he followed my thesis to the end. And he was really a good person to help me. <laughs> You got him involved in one way or another. Go there ever. He never joined me there. And so my my research itself was two years at the two Oktoberfests, asking people in the beer tents, the regular folks. I didn't interview the owners of the beer tents because they're very rich and they see it from a totally different point of view. They make all this money in the breweries. They put out all this, you know, there's so much cash flow there. I wanted to know what is the experience of the regular folks that come to the festival, the young, the old, the Bavarians, the, the foreigners, whatever. And what's the experience of the waitresses and the waiters, the people working there? This is what my main interest was. Mm -hmm. So I really did interviews. And I did interviews on the Oktoberfest, which wasn't so easy to do because it's so loud and so noisy. And there's so much, you know, clunk. Reveling. You know how loud this is if you clunk two glasses together and things like this. They have music, they have rhythm, they have staff music. So I had a thing like I only could interview people with a maximum of two beers, right? I see. Or they beers. would be incoherent, yeah. Over two beers, you couldn't speak to anybody anymore, so you couldn't do this. So a little intoxication was fine, but not more than two liters, otherwise you couldn't speak to the people. And of course, some people couldn't follow the interview anymore because they were drunk already, or <laughs> some didn't want to follow the interview because they wanted to have fun and not talk about their experience. But I made a great, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I had a, a cut of about 40 people that I interviewed in two years uh, and having serious material. And then I did this complete psycho psychological research in doing a qualitative study. In looking at what I had, I had like, I don't know, hundreds of pages of interviews typed out. I had transcripts made. And then looking for the main uh, subjects. What do they talk about? What is their favorite thing? What do they love? And it boils down to a few little things. People go to the festival because they want community. Mm -hmm. They want to join in with others. They want community. And they want a sense of Heimat, what they call here in Germany. Heimat would be belonging to your homeland. This is like this Bavarian oh. pride of belonging to your piece of earth you're living on. You know, it's like Heimat feeling. It's, a, it's romantic in a way. And then there's all this romanticism too, because on the Oktoberfest, um, it's not, there's one thing that the Oktoberfest went through a lot of different developments. So put it in the, in the time after the war until up to the 90s, people used to go to the Oktoberfest in regular clothes like jeans and t-shirts and leather jackets and, 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 and kind of everyday clothes. But in the 90s, suddenly some young student women discovered uh, dirndl dresses, these Bavarian women dresses, which were made in the 70s when the Olympic Games were happening in Munich. I see. Munich had the Olympic Summer Games in 1972, and they decided that the hostesses, the young girls and helpers in the Olympic Games should wear the Bavarian dirndl dress to be traditional in a way. Like and a cosplay, even, in a sense, yeah, that same the spirit way, of diving on in. The German, on the German Lufthansa like airline, they started wearing these dirndl dresses on this Olympic uh, game kind of time in 72. And because it was still hippie time, 72 was like the end of the mini dress area in a way, they created 
the little mini dresses for regular women to wear because it was kind of cool. And these were gone from the surface. Nobody knew about these things. And in the 90s, young students, like in the beginning of the 90s, they dug them out of secondhand stores. And suddenly young women appeared on the Oktoberfest with these mini journals that were like 20 years old. Wow. And everybody said, where did you get this? I want the same thing. Uh -huh. And this blasted this whole, uh, uh, whole production of modern time Bavarian dresses for the Oktoberfest. Uh -huh. When I used to go to the Oktoberfest in the beginning of the 90s, I went in jeans and t-shirt and just regular clothes. In the middle of the 90s, everybody wanted these dresses and this whole industry started producing these dresses. And now you hardly see anybody without it. Now everybody wears this. It's, it started a trend. And the young men used to wear like jeans and then they started wearing these later hose and these Bavarian leather pants from, from the 90s on. And now the Oktoberfest has turned into this kind of fashionable kind of thing that you're in if you wear this. And you're not so in if you don't wear it. So people start <laughs> buying this, you know. We have to have you model your dirndl that you're wearing so everyone can I'm see what you're talking about. And, yeah. And as you say, so never underestimate good. the power of a good dirndl. Go and I can see why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the power of a good dirndl is in the, in the waist and it's up here. You know, you see that? Yes. And this is the, the, like, the female thing about the goddess thing, you know? You're like a princess in a dirndl. Like this, you have this kind of little, you know, the apron and have a little, little underskirt. And the funny thing is, for everybody who doesn't know this, I have my, the bow shows if you're married or if you're looking for a man. Ah. The way the bow is placed shows, like I have it on the left side, which means I'm not married, I'm looking for a guy. Women are married, they have it on the right side. Handy. And women, I think, who are, this is like the, this is like the important thing in the Oktoberfest. It is like you look for a spouse, maybe, or getting involved with people sure so from the dental you can tell if the woman is looking or not yeah if she's free or not free you can tell from the... but this is tradition this is old old tradition in bavaria that when they had village dances the women used to mark themselves with the with the bow on the on the apron so men would know where to engage themselves or not very simple yeah not get into trouble. You took me uh, dirndl shopping because we had to go see. It was fascinating. The high-end stores and the expensive fabrics and the beautiful ones down to the vintage ones. Um, it was really fast. I couldn't buy a dirndl because we were traveling very, very light with a single backpack. But um, it was really an, uh, interesting to see the huge industry now with this very traditional costume, which, yeah, um, yeah which really shows off a woman's assets. So it makes sense <laughs> for your goddess uh, yeah. incarnation. If, if, yeah. if you look at the guys, I mean, I don't have a leader who isn't to show you now, but the leather pants are very traditional country clothes. They used to wear this for, um, you know, in the fields to plow the, the field and to work with the cows and like a cowboy kind of thing. So the leather, leather hose and its leather pants were like, you couldn't kill them. You wore them all your life. Actually. So, <laughs> well, I have to tell you that my Swiss grandfather, Fritz, came over from Switzerland, created a farm out of five acres in Washington state, grew everything, fermented foods. Oh yeah, beer, wine, cheese, made it all himself. Grew the orchard, the honey wow. with the bees, the vegetable garden, um, the stream, and... dried fish, grew tobacco when, one year, my mother said it didn't work. Dried his herbs up in the attic, did the entire thing, and had a pair of lederhosen and his little passport on vellum paper, kid vellum. Mm -hmm. And the passport was generally said, um, he's from Mimisen, Messen in Switzerland, near Bern. Mm -hmm. And it said, Fritz is an upstanding gentleman. Uh, anybody who wants to talk, he's very good. Yeah, that was the passport in those days. Oh yeah. It was really, uh, really beautiful. So brought some of the traditional jewelry, no dirndls, but at least a pair of leader, leather lederhosen in the family archives, but go ahead. Yeah. So. So about the lederhosen, there's another thing because they're actually country pants. They're worn for the field, but they have good ones for Sunday, right? And they have a short one for the summer, a medium one to the knee for whatever hiking or whatever they need, and they have a long one down to the ankles. So usually on the Oktoberfest, the short ones are worn because it's still like summery weather sometimes. And these sh these lederhosen, they show the men's calves, the legs, and it's very important. It's like a woman showing her waist and her upper, you know. Decolleté, men would show their calves because in old times it used to be important that a man has good calves. Because if you have good calves, you can feed a family. 
You could go oh. the plow or drive the cows or you could go hunting or you go up the mountains. The mountains are only 50 miles away from here. I'm living 50 miles from the Alps. So uh, the Alpine structure is still there. So the physical looks of a person was important to, to, to raise a family. And it's still now, since the women start wearing these dirndl dresses, the men start wearing these lederhosen again since the 90s, the young men. <laughs> yeah. And it's very important to have good calves because if you have thin legs, it's not really attractive. <laughs> and so, yes, like well, so, attractiveness um, is such a biological imperative for one, uh, the female to assess the male and say, do I want to bear his children? Is he going to take care of me? I mean, all of these are markers for the species to... Um, Perfect. recognize a proper man yeah and there are men in munich exactly they say i can wear a short later i don't have good calves they're too thin so women won't look at that so i better wear long pants right and you wouldn't believe it i mean the, the craziness is total there's one later host shop in town they created and around the calves they used to have these woolen socks that are only a ring of socks you know these uh. so they don't wear things that are down to the ankle to mm -hmm. warm the leg, they have a, like a, a, re, a ring-shaped stocking that's around the calves to warm the upper part of the leg. Mm -hmm. Because in old times, they didn't even have socks in their shoes. They were barefoot, usually, in mm -hmm. old, old times. Wow. So, a few improvements for so comfort. If you have a, a stocking, you have to try it. It warms the whole leg, actually, if you have the stocking only around yeah. your ankle. I'm surprised they don't sell calf. socks that and stuff shot, the calf and make it a little bit more oh. prominent. But go ahead. That's yeah, what I trust yeah, you to yeah. say. That's what they did. There's one shop in Munich who created these push-up calf stockings for men <laughs> to make the calf look bigger. I mean, this is like ridiculous. I don't. I don't I, this thing's gonna fall off in a little bit. But they did try. Like women have a push-up bra. They made these push-up yeah. stockings for men for the calf. They did indeed. They did right. this. Enhance your assets, whatever they be. It yeah. Is, yeah so, so it makes sense that this is the ritual costume, and you also might say that this is a continuation of those fertility festivals, in a sense. Yeah. It's got the hallmarks. Yeah. yeah. There's another thing on top that um, that if, of course um, the men's costumes not only have the lederhosen and the, the thing with the calves, they do have the hats. And on the heads, they have this kind of thing. It looks like a brush. Have you ever seen that? Mm -mm. It's called the Gumspard. You'll show us so, pictures, though. Yeah. So, well, this, well I, I actually don't have a picture with the brush thing on the head. The thing, the, 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 the brush on the head is not a brush. The brush on the head is a hair from a mountain goat, right? And the hair from the mountain goat is where to get because, oh, there it is. I have the calf stockings here on the book there. Do you see oh, this? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. These are the calf stockings. They're only on the calves, they're not on the rest of the leg. Gotcha. And the, the, the thing on the head, the um, this gum spot thing, is, uh, I'm, I'm looking in the book, is uh, made from goat hair, but the goat uh, is a mountain goat and the hair is being pulled out from the backside of the goat. So to have a really big brush on your on your head, you need to kill about 200 goats. Oh, wow. So it's not like something you get easily. It's like, a, it's, it shows a hunter's luck. In old times, they would have hunted this themselves. Looks like this. See this oh. on the head? Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's like a, it looks like a big brush thing coming up. But this thing he's wearing in this size, this is like a $20,000 one, right? Wow. Oh, wow. It's so, expensive. it's so expensive because a mountain goat, see this, it's very traditional. And they uh, give it to their sons and the, their grandchildren. It's been given on from the grandfathers. Because a big size thing costs twenty thousand. You can get small ones from fifty up, but a really good one is traditionally big and expensive and shows a man's precision money wise. Mm -hmm. So a woman can tell if a guy has a big uh, gum spot on his head, the guy has cash. It's very easy, you know. The bigger the the, the gum spot, the bigger the money. So it's like that, you know. It's very simple. And the next thing is that they do wear in front of the lederhosen. They wear silver chains you maybe have seen that they have silver chains and on the silver chains they have traditionally hunting how you call this hunting trophies so the hunting trophies are like little bits and pieces like a claw from an eagle or it's maybe the teeth of a weasel or it's maybe a part of a, a bone from a from a deer or something like this Wait, and, and this is goes way way back doesn't it yeah. This goes way, way back. And they wear it in silver chains. You can buy them now in the shops, of course, and they're also expensive. 
And these, they call it the Sharivari. The Sharivari is a French word. Sharivari means a diverse kind of thing, a chain. And also this shows how much money or how much hunting luck the owner has. Hmm. Because the more and better these hunting trophies are, and they're worn in front of the, the crotch actually, it's on the, on the upper part of the pants. So they show how much power a man has because in old times they would have gone to the mountains and shot this themselves. Now they go to the shop and buy it. You can't shoot, go out and shoot it anymore. Yeah. But this is another traditional thing showing the power and money and uh, success. So a woman looking for a guy with success, you need the guy with the big gum spart and the big shoddy body to be successful. I'm sure it was just the same back in Paleolithic times. No. I'm sure it's very ancient. The, the Oktoberfest yeah. is very, very archaic kind of tradition. And it's funny that nobody really ever looked at this the way I did. They just did it and they never questioned it. And I looked at it from a psychologist point of view and said, this is like shamanism, what they're doing. It's like the men show their hunting luck and their trophies and the size of the trophies and, you know, show themselves as great guys. And the women show their, you know, their waistline and their whatever assets they have to look nice to attract each other. And that's why you named your paper, your research paper, Oktoberfest, Mass, Intoxication, and Ritual. You're covering yes. all of those those aspects. Yes. Yeah, um, and it's about, and the Oktoberfest is a very big ritual. And I, I explain more to this if I do the slideshow, because um, there are so many um, folk fests in Germany. I mean, the Oktoberfest is not the only one. There's many, but it's the biggest in size. It's the most traditional actually today is the day the Oktoberfest has its birthday. It's the 17th of October, 1810. Ah. The Oktoberfest started. And this is today. Today is the 211th day, uh, birthday of the Oktoberfest. That's why I'm going to drink to it now one more time. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's a very light beer. It's not strong. So this, I can go ahead. Here, <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. This is also one of them. This is the most traditional brewery in Bavaria. This is Augustiner in Munich. They still make the beer in wooden kegs. It's oak kegs because all the other breweries decided to do it in steel, in big steel containers. So they still have wooden kegs. The biggest keg is 200 liters. It's very heavy, very big. And they still roll them out by men on, you know, on the on the truck. So it's very, it, it's the most traditional brewery in, in Munich is this one. Wow. Yeah. Right. I can't I even imagine the quantity of beer that they go through for an Oktoberfest. Six million, Six million people, you say, attend it. A dozen beer tents housing 10,000 people at a time. Tell us the scale. You just mentioned how, how big this is. Well, Give the us some stats. Kinda, it, it didn't really start small because the Oktoberfest, what a lot of people don't know, and I'm showing the uh, uh, my, my slideshow, it's a wedding festival it's not a, it's neither harvest festival nor beer festival it was the wedding of king ludwig the first of bavaria with his princess and this is the for the sake of the wedding they made a big party with the uh, people living in the city and uh this was like twenty five thousand people when they started with the wedding mm. at the time Brigitte, let's 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 go to your slideshow yeah. that would be good to see I the pictures as say, well. the light is changing it because the sun is setting i'm here on the dark side of when i guess it is so yeah. I, I just wanted to, my, my light's changing because the sun is going down. Yeah. Okay, you want me to start the, the slideshow and explain it there? Please do. Yeah, Please we're going to hear about the goddess Bavaria. We're going to hear about so, uh, you tell I, I, Do you see right. this all? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. So it's the Oktoberfest <clears throat> mass ecstasy. I call it ecstasy. You call it intoxication. I call it ecstasy because intoxication relates a lot to a drug or a drink. And the Oktoberfest... Uh, puts people in a state of ecstasy even without drinking anything because it's such ah, a, an exciting kind of place of lights and music and hundreds, thousands of people. So you carried away with it without drinking even. This is why intoxication, I think it's, it's, it's too short for this whole phenomenon. So rituals and ecstasy, that's what it is. So I have the history of the greatest folk system in the world. I'll give you a few uh, keywords here. It was the wedding, oh, come on, that's what it wants to. It's the wedding of Crown Prince Ludwig and Princess Theresa, you see the 12th was the wedding day. Can you see mm -hmm. this arrow that I'm pointing? Yes, you we can. can. We sure oh, can. Okay. So this was the wedding. It was celebrated in town. And this is the day today. This is the 17th of October, 2010. A horse race was made on a meadow outside the city. 
and to honor the king and to give joy to the people because the horse race was the event of the time. It was the enjoyment of the uh, citizens. And uh, at the meadow now is called the Theresian Wiese because the princess was called Theresia. So the meadow of Theresia is now the field where the Oktoberfest happens. It's a big empty spot in the middle of the city that is still kept empty for this occasion. Of course, they first started, this is only a one year affair, it was only a wedding. They liked it so much, they did it the next year again. So 1811, they started doing the Oktoberfest as with a central agricultural fair. They put a country fair with it. And they just, the king decided the Oktoberfest was to be a Bavarian national festivity. And they installed it for good. Because uh, first of all, they liked it so much and people like to celebrate, but it also had a political reason. Bavaria had never been a kingdom before. Bavarians only had dukes and duchess and stuff like this. So it wasn't a high kingdom. It was just a regular nobility. And Napoleon had taken over Europe and Bavaria. And Napoleon had installed the first Bavarian king. But of course, B B Napoleon made a deal. The first Bavarian king was installed four years before the Oktoberfest, 1806. And Napoleon, of course, wanted uh, gave them a king, installed a king. But he wanted the young Bavarian man to fight in his wars. And they had the oh. Bavarian-Austrian war. And a lot of Bavarian young men had to go with Napoleon to war and they didn't like this, of course. So the Bavarians had to give the young men for the fighting of Napoleon. So the kingdom wasn't really much liked at the time. It was a political thing. But the king needed uh, the support of the folk, of the people, and decided what's a better thing to give the people a festival of joy and fun to unite the different counties. So Bavaria consists of a lot of different counties with different backgrounds. Some of them are Catholic, some are more Protestant, and they never went along well together so much, actually. And the king had the idea if he put an agricultural fair and made it a national festival, maybe those parts of the country would unite. So it was a political kind of decision to do this. And it's a better thing to give the people drink and fun and, you know, they come together and they enjoy each other and they're not going to be enemies anymore. That's a good thing to do. So there was no beer in the beginning. You see, the first beer tapping was in 1815. So five years, there was no beer at all. It was only a horse race and some little you know, food things there, so no beer. And the first amusement places like bowling and kid swings, there wasn't any electricity at the time. They only had these little things. They came like 1817. So hang on, am I going the wrong way here? We got to tour the uh, little oh, castle okay. of Ludwig. That was really interesting. Yes, you did that. Munich. You saw that. Very so baroque, this, yeah. So this is an oil painting of the first horse race. And you see it's a very empty far place. And you see the city of Munich back there in the background. And you would see the mountains all the way across the Alps back there. And you see it's not built up. It was an empty kind of field. And a lot of people came. And this is what it looked like in 1810. Now the city is around it, of course. The first agricultural thing was important to make the, for the agriculture to make, you know, they get prices for better breeding of cows and uh, horses and things like this. So this was like to uh, install a new kind of um, better economy in Bavaria. The Oktoberfest itself developed uh, slowly in a way, but if, when you start giving out beer, I mean, things get speed up, I guess. So the first beer hut, uh, you give the people beer and they want it again. So every year they repeat this. So the beer at first, the first thing there was not any tents at all. It was small huts in a circle that where they gave away beer, and they had a central bandstand of music with Bavarian folk music, mostly and military bands. A, pro, a prohibition to dance came already in 1825 because young men used to fight about the women, and there were fights all the time. And the Bavarians are really kind of rough race, I guess they they do, you know, they get to it if it's time to do it. So the there's a prohibition to dance on the Oktoberfest till now. You're not supposed to dance. You can jump and do different things, but not dance. Huh. The Bavaria statue was erected in 1850. This is like the, the statue that looks like the goddess of Bavaria, in a way that's on my book here, also on the front page, this one woman uh -huh. with the lion. A representation of actually, a goddess, yeah. Yeah, she's a representation of the goddess. And King Ludwig I was so much in love with Greece and Italy that he wanted to install, install like Athena was the goddess of Athens, Greece. Uh -huh. He wanted to install the Bavaria as the goddess of Bavaria. 
it was meant he wanted this to happen to make B B Munich like a uh, like Athens or like Rome. So he brought in all these uh, Greek Italian architects to build these buildings here. The city has a lot of Italian and Greek architecture here. Mm -hmm. So this Bavaria was like the goddess of the state, and now is the goddess of the of the Oktoberfest. I think that's what I think. They did different things. Like they, then they had a Bavarian Olympic Games, which is very funny. They did stuff on the on the Oktoberfest, like having young men uh, climb poles and do races, and it's all to improve, you know, to improve uh, athletes, the athletes, and all these things inside Bavaria. It's very, you couldn't think of it now, but they did this at the time, just to, for you to understand. The Wiesn is the short word for the Oktoberfest. This is what the Bavarians call it. This is the word for meadow. They just say, "I'm going to the meadow." And everybody knows what they mean. They say, I'm going to the reason everybody understands what's meant by this. So the first mats and beer, March beer was introduced in 1871, which means the beer was before a very thin light beer, which didn't last and which easily wasted. And um, in seven, 18, really late actually, they introduced this mats and beer, which is brewed in March. It's put into cellars and kept underground in the cool till September, and then they bring it back out. Hmm. So the beer is stronger. It says 6% of alcohol. And this is why it keeps longer. And this is why they could brew it in the spring and bring it out in the, in the fall and let it sit there for a long time. The, um, it's stronger. And it has the advantage that in Munich, you have to understand in Munich in old times, they didn't have, there was no way of cooling. There was no electricity yet. And they had to cool the beer in caves and in uh, cellars uh, down in the ground. And the medicine beer is stronger, so it can be kept under the ground during this time. Oh, interesting. Okay. And they did have a brewing, they did prohibit beer brewing in the summer all the time at the time because they couldn't cool it and the beer wasted so fast and went sour. So in Bavaria, you couldn't brow, make beer. I think it was from May till uh, uh, August. There was no beer brewing because the beer went sour too quickly. And, you know, the people had problems with their health. So the medicine beer is a strong beer that's kept in the basement till uh, fall so time. Higher alcoholic content helped it preserve it. Yeah, and it was stay longer. Yeah, to stay longer. Yeah. So, and they still do this beer for the Oktoberfest. It's a special Oktoberfest beer that they still do only for the Oktoberfest here. Interesting. So the first big beer tent came late in 1898. The first big tent came of a guy called Georg Lang, who was an, uh, um, uh, how do I say, an economist. He knew how to make money and how to what people wanted. So I show you these pictures. This is what it looked like before: the little huts and the beer gardens. This is what the Oktoberfest was like for almost 80 years. It looked like this: uh, people celebrating outdoors with a, just a, a little hut around it. This is how it grew towards the end of the uh, 19th century. You see the city of Munich in the background and you see the king's tent. The king used to sit in the big tent in the middle. And this is where the audience were. And this is, you see the horse racing there. So the horse race was still the main thing to do because it didn't have electricity and no way to, you know, uh, have any merry-go-rounds yet at the time. If you want to know where I'm living, I'm living about here on the right edge of the big tree. This is where I'm about at. So oh. I'm close to this whole thing. I'm sitting right here. Behind and I think house. we saw the cuckoo clocks with the double tower or something. We watched that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is like the, the, the Bavarian Olympics. It's very funny. This is why I put the picture in. They did pole climbing, bike racing, and had athletes to, you know, improve, you know, men's health, I guess, or something like this. It's Show funny. off their prowess. Huh? Yeah, show their calves, I guess. I don't know. Race <laughs> <laughs> is funky. So, the development of the fest itself as the, as the beer festival that we know it now. So, this guy, Georg Lang, he was from Nuremberg, actually. He wasn't from Munich. This is why nobody mentions him in the city. Still, the Nuremberg and the Munich people have a kind of diverse idea about how things should go. So, he was from the north of Bavaria. He built the first big beer tent, and it, of modern size, he had 6,000 guests already. 140 waitresses, that's a lot. And a central bandstand in the middle of the of the tent. The tent still looked that way. It's the same thing they look still. And he created the first Oktoberfest hit songs. <laughs> you have so to have a chance. Out. That's part of the festival. Yeah. So he gave out a booklet with sing-along text to sing music. And he knew that the people would sing. They would start, a, a, you know, um, getting being funny and drinking more and this would make uh, better money it was a mixture of making better money and also giving the people more choice or the hit songs 
booklet sing-along thing was really important and the people still do this they still do the sing-along at the time it was like more traditional songs now it's more like pop songs from the radio actually you wouldn't believe one of the most favorite country uh, um, Oktoberfest hits is Take Me Home Country Road by John Denver. John Denver. Yeah. John Denver's Take Me Home Country Road is one of the top Oktoberfest hits each year. Yeah. Still <laughs> Hardly every, any, almost everybody in the city can sing this song here. <laughs> I they read where works. John Denver gave a tape of his song to a Chinese official and a Japanese delegate, and they took it to their home countries, and now it's just hugely popular um, there, well, too. Yeah. So to this day. Yeah. The first beer tent with the lighting, with electric lighting, was started in 1901. Uh, my, one of my favorite tents, Broy Rosal, is a, have a, have a very nice beer there. And the, this is just a little story at the side. The electric lighting was done by the uncle of Albert Einstein, you know, Albert Einstein, the physicist, the famous yeah. guy with the relativity theory. Einstein was a young boy at the time, a young kid, and he was born in Augsburg, not far away. And he did help his uncle to electrify the Oktoberfest. So Albert Einstein is a 19 year old, was there drawing cables, screwing in the light bulbs. So he worked <laughs> on the Oktoberfest when he was, and they lived only two blocks down the road here, uh, putting electric light on the Oktoberfest. So Einstein was busy with that at the time. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. And also at the time, they didn't have, like I said, much light in, in electric, yet they had review theaters. It was very famous at the time, turn of the century from Paris. They had dancers and they had, you know, uh, magic shows and they had exotic exhibitions. They would show like Hawaiian village or African village or, you know, all these things people couldn't see on it. There was no television or there was only theater. So they did all these exotic kind of things on the Oktoberfest. There's only two review theaters left in this year. They still have to, to keep it as a tradition. So the Oktoberfest grew and grew and grew. And there's one question always, why does the Oktoberfest start in September? Because the Oktoberfest started the first time in, in, on the 17th of October. And like you said before, Laura Lee, they put it forward to September because of the weather. It was just too cold to be happily celebrating in a beer garden. Mm -hmm. And so the Oktoberfest now starts in September and ends on the first Sunday in October. Hmm. The last day of the festival is the first Sunday in October. So they kept the October in the festival, but for weather reasons, they put it forward. It, it moved forward. I think in the 1920s, it was where it, like it's now. It starts on the second Sunday in September and ends on the first Sunday in October. Still called Oktoberfest. Yeah, and canceled this year, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, twice now. They got tw canceled for the Corona problem in the 1920, uh, 2020 and 21 now. But this was not the first time it, it saw the Oktoberfest 30 times, three zero times was not happening for different reasons. They had a kind of a pandemic in the 1870s. They had cholera here in the city. Mm -hmm. And so two years, there was no Oktoberfest for the cholera epidemic was here. And then you had all these wars. You had the war against the French. Oh, you had yeah. the war, the First World War, the Second World War, different things like this. So during the war times, of course, it was not an Oktoberfest. The first Oktoberfest after the World War was in 1949. Hmm. This is when they started the first festival again. They had a little, you know, supposed to be Oktoberfest, but the real Oktoberfest happened since 1949. And it's the first time it stopped since then, according to the Corona problem. This is last year. In 2010, the Oktoberfest had its 200 years history, uh, anniversary. And they started a historic reason, a historic Oktoberfest, showing the people how it might have been like 200 years ago. So they had the tents looking more traditional. They had the horse race back, a small horse race. Uh, they showed old gear from the Oktoberfest and, and different things. So it was really nice to see this historic part. And because everybody liked it so much, they did try to keep it. They're always keeping things here, you know? They do it <laughs> once, they love it, and they just keep it for good. So now the Oide Wiesn is installed, the, the old Oktoberfest, which is called. And it's a part of the Oktoberfest now that shows uh, historic things. And uh, uh, they have more traditional beer tents and more traditional, and uh, another kind of beer actually. And they have to be in steins and not in glasses. So they go back in tradition. It's interesting to see that. So this is the guy who installed the very first Oktoberfest tent, Mr. Lang. This is what the Oktoberfest looked like about turn of the century. 
Do you see the you see this temple thing back there? Yes. Oh yeah. This is the Bavaria statue standing there, and this is a Greek temple around it. Oh. So this is the King Ludwig. So it looks like a Greek that thing in Athens, right? Yeah. And this is like oh. the goddess of the Oktoberfest stands there. And this is like the king's tent. This one is the king's tent. And you see there's these first big tents happening. This is like 1900. It is something like that here. Hmm. And this is like one of those exotic shows. It's very funny. This is supposed to be the holy cow of India, Benares, <laughs> which is funny. Um, and it's a tattooed oxen from India. I don't believe this. I'm sure they just painted a, 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 an animal from Bavaria and put it there like this. <laughs> but everybody loved it, it seems. So they, they had these, you know, kind of um, exotic shows for people to enjoy, which was, you know, was a little tacky, but, you know, it was a sensation at the time. I'm sure it was like really wild, you know, 1905, they had the, the it's, holy. It's Shiva. always interesting to me, the celebration of the bison and the auroch from uh, the Paleolithic times and even the white buffalo calf and Native American, so that the cow has been celebrated uh, so much through history. Uh, yeah, along I think with the horse. Yeah. Looking here at India, I think this is the holy animal of Shiva, the god of fire and transformation. So he's yeah. riding on a, on a, on a, what do you call this? An ox? That's not an ox. What do you call this? Uh, Oruk, the the oh, I don't know, but the horns also horns as headdresses you yeah, find yeah. Uh, so often. It's very okay. exotic. It's very uh, traditional uh, shaman stuff too. I think. Yeah, and so, six million visitors. Uh, Oktoberfest hit by 1985. It's a lot. So uh, it's still. I it think the six million just stayed uh, in this range. I mean, it didn't get much more. It went six point five, six million. So actually, this, the, the place can take more people. It's just full at some point. And the Oktoberfest has about, so you see the size, it's, it's all about 104 four acres of land. It's wow. empty all year round. They only use it for the Oktoberfest. Since 85, they have about 6 million visitors drinking 6 million liters of beer, which is a lot. Hmm. Um, so everybody would drink one liter, which is not true because babies and old people don't drink one liter. There's guys drinking six liters themselves. So it <laughs> depends on the guests, right? Uh, the high times are Saturdays and Sundays. You have up to 450,000 people on the festival ground in one in one day. It's very huge. It's a half a million almost in one day. Hmm. Uh, during the week, it's a little less normally. The Oktoberfest has big tents, 12 big tents, seating six to 10,000 people each. And having people standing with a mug in your hand and having little beer gardens around the tents, you come up to 13,000, 15,000 people per tent drinking beer there. So the size matters. It's really huge. They have 30 smaller tents uh, where they maybe have people, 200 people, 500 people, or something like that. Uh, so there's a lot of occasions where you can go and sit and have a beer. This song, this is one of the part of the ritual, the Prosit der Gemütlichkeit, the Eins, zwei, drei, so This is this kind of ritual that they do and repeat all the time in the beer tent. And people when they sorry, I have this beer now for us all. So this um prosit deck, it goes like this. I sing you this. It goes like this. Ein prosit, ein prosit der Gemütlichkeit. Ein prosit, ein prosit der Gemütlichkeit. And it goes eins, zwei, drei, xufa. And xufa means drink it and with the one, two, three, everybody goes to the glass and drinks. And the thing is, they, they, they made a calculation. Thousand liters of beer are spilled in each beer tent singing this song. Either they drink it or they spill it at the time. So it's thousand liters lost in this one song. So it's uh, it's economically, it's great. Oh, well, and it's like an offering to the ground, to Mother Earth, isn't it? it you pour well, your no, libation no, no, no. to the earth and you are uh, giving an it's, offering yeah. to the gods, yeah. It's not a conscious libation, but it happens. The, the, the most important thing about this song is that if 10,000 people sing this song in a tent and they sing it together, it's like in a church. This is this amazing thing. Mm -hmm. If you have a tent of 10,000 people singing the same song at the same time, drinking and clinking their glasses at the same time, it is a repetitive ritual act. Oh, yeah. And in none, in none of the German uh, folks fest, this is done in a way like the Oktoberfest does it. And some tends to it more, other tends to it less, but the tent I go to, they, they play this about four to three times in an hour. 
So you, the, 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 the group of people in a tent really merge together as a homogenous mass. The mass gets together, united in a communion through the singing of the song because they always drink together and they cheer with each other. So this song is kind of, I would say, the glue of the Oktoberfest ritual. Yeah. It brings people together with this kind of singing and doing this. And it is exhilarating just sitting in a big sports stadium and then doing the wave yeah. or singing the, the team songs or... Uh, whatever yeah that's the idea so it's like what you do away from a sports stadium is about what happens here so mm-hmm. like i said um germans aren't the kind to easily get excited right it takes a little bit you know in america i find people <laughs> much more easily excited in, in sports and in, in movies and in theaters and, and whatever germans need a little bit more you know to get going but in the october first they do it they get to the point yeah so Visitors spend an average of 75 euro each visit, which was like two years ago. So the October brings to the city about 1 billion of euros in sales, uh, like also including the hotels and what people eat and drink in the city. So the festival brings about half a, a billion and people living and spending money in the town is the same. So they lost this twice already here. So this is what a big tent looks like when it's being built up. This is the raw structure of it. You see how big they are? And yeah. the Oktoberfest is always built up and built down. It never stays. They, they remove this whole thing again. Goodness. They start setting up in June. They build till September when the festival starts. And they have to be done by 1st of November. So from middle of June to 1st of November, the city is totally occupied by this Oktoberfest, built up and built down. Hmm. So it's like, a, it's really a ritual in the city that people enjoy looking forward to the Oktoberfest. It's, it's taking up a great space psychologically and of course also financially but also in a way of joy you know people are just fascinated by it so you see this is the ground plan of the Oktoberfest this is like you see this kind of oval shape here mm-hmm. this used to be the horse racing ring this is why it's this shape <laughs> the horses ran around there oh, wow. so they, they kept the shape of this horse racing thing hmm. this is where the statue of Bavaria is standing the goddess of the Oktoberfest is here and these are the big tents you see this how it's huge big tents here so this is the big ones. The small ones aren't even in there. I mean, there's a two small ones. There's, a, there's one important thing. There's a wine tent also. There's one wine tent because um, Bavaria used to be a wine growing area since the Romans, since the Roman period. When the Romans uh-huh. came here 2000 years ago, the Romans didn't drink beer. They brought the wine. Right. So they were growing wine in Bavaria, which is not uh, done anymore. There's only one wine uh, kind of, what do you call this wine mountain thing? Mm-hmm. on the Danube River, there's still one wine thing growing. They all switched to beer at, at some point, unfortunately, because they could grow wine, I guess, if they wanted to. So mm-hmm. the wine tent has a tradition that's, you know, 2,000 years of Roman history yeah. in this area. The Romans were here. So this it's is like a uh, burning man. You build it and then you tear it down every year, isn't it? Yeah. And that's part of the fun. Wow. So, so you see uh, part of the, 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 the rides. I mean, people used to forget that the Oktoberfest does have rides now. It's not just beer tents. It's half of the area is, see, half of this, this is beer tents. And the, the lower part, this is rides down here. Mm-hmm. So this is the ride. So they have this. Something uh, for the road. kids. Yeah. Well, I love this. I love, this is my favorite looping thing here. This is the five looping, Olympia looping roller coaster. I just love this. Have a beer. Drink one of this and ride the, the, the loop. You don't need anything else. This is it. Yeah. Well, a wild happy. ride fits right in, doesn't it? A wild, exhilarating ride physically. Yeah. Um, yeah. On, a, on like a spirit thing. journey, you know, you're, you're traveling yeah. through space in this crazy way. I mean, it kind this of fits the theme, doesn't it? This is why people say the Oktoberfest is intoxicating by itself. You see all the people walking around. You have the rides and the speed, the acceleration of, you know, adrenaline goes up and you're excited. And if you're just being on this uh, on this ground of the Oktoberfest with music and everything happening, you get in this kind of rausch feel. It, rausch is a German word for being intoxicated, being ec- ecstatic, euphor- mm-hmm. euphoria. So this is what happens when you go there. So you see there's a lot of tradition, young people with music. You see this guy having a lederhosen. This is like the lederhosen pants he wears. And they have, this is part of this old traditional Oktoberfest. They have little groups making music there sometimes compared to the big groups in the big tents. So it's always a thing between tradition and modernism. You see, this is very typical. This is an old Bavarian kind of style thing. This is like a spaceship kind of ride back there. 
And this is the Löwenbräu Leo lion. This is the <laughs> brand mark of the Löwenbräu ten sitting up on a on a on a kind of tower thing. And this is what you get there. You get the modern, you get a spaceship and the tradition, right? And this makes it so fascinating. Well, I just want to say that the Lohenmensch, the lion man artifact, goes back forty thousand years. A lion man hybrid. So it doesn't surprise me to see an iconic lion holding his beer stein uh there but the lion is also the, the lion is also i know this lion man you talk about it this was found just a few hundred uh, miles from here it's uh, close to Ulm. exactly Ulm, where they in a cave it out of, in a cave right yeah but the lion is also what he called this in the shield of arms of bavaria the lion is the animal in the shield of arms of the bavarian king they have this lion also uh -huh. so it's part of the bavarian um uh, you know this is me with the moose, right? So you see all these funny things. You have this moose. It looks like Canada here. And you can get all the kinds of rides and things going around the festival. Well, you have to say so, that back in Paleolithic times, 40,000 years ago, you had cave lions. You don't have lions there now. So no. it really does harken <laughs> no back to a very old uh, time. But go ahead. Sorry. So now we, I come to the mass, to the mass of people. And I related my studies to theories of Sigmund Freud and Elias Canetti, Elias Canetti, both writing about mass psychology. And uh, it's hard to pronounce these words for me. The heterogeneous and the homogeneous mass. Do I pronounce this right? Yes. So the differentiation is this one. Sorry. If you are on the Oktoberfest grounds outside the tents, people are walking crisscross around and everybody does their own little individual thing. This would be the heterogeneous mass. So the mass of people is running in different ways, doing their own little thing. It gets nervous sometimes. Sometimes it's too much when everybody runs in different uh, um, directions. So this is not very uh, united in a way. The homogeneous mass happens inside the beer tents. Mm. After singing this Prosider Gemütlichkeit, after drinking, and you have also this, you share the pretzel sometimes, see this? Mm -hmm. So this is the, the Oktoberfest food that we use. They're much bigger on the Oktoberfest uh, to share. You can break them and share them with other people. So the homogeneous mass happens inside the tents through drinking, singing, sharing the food, sharing the drink, sharing the excitement. And they grow together as a group, almost like in a church congregation over time. So when you go to a beer tent in Munich and you have this big mass of beer, you stay there like two, three, four, six hours, sometimes longer, and become united with those people sitting on your table. There's these big tables, they seat like eight to 10 people mm -hmm. and you become a group of friends. Mm -hmm. First, you don't know anybody. And in the end, you, you know, you're hugging each other and you think it's totally great. So this kind of union that happens, this community is part of the ritual. People want to make new friends, want, want to belong together. And this happens inside the beer tent through the ritual. This is what happens inside. When you go outside, you have, you have this kind of mass, inside it's this kind of mass. And this is very attractive to people because they want to be part of this warm, celebrating, happy mass inside the tents. So you always have a queue outside the tents of people wanting to go in. Especially on weekends, you have a lot of queuing people wanting to be part of this. And that homogenous um, drive is really tribal, isn't it? To identify yeah, with the a small group drive, of people I think This is like a, a very human thing that people want to be part of the action. You want to be part of where the fun is or where it's warm and nice and cozy and you belong. Mm -hmm. If you're standing outside, it's often cold and you're alone. It's not like very funny, you know. Inside, it's more like you unite. It's this kind of coming together in a way of merging with each other. It's yeah. a melting together as a group. And it's, it's it happens in small groups. You do a circle in a tippy, you know, you do a circle uh, around the fireplace. It's the same thing. You do with the family around the Christmas tree. It's a small part of that. But the, the homogeneous mass is like 10,000 people in a beer tent cheering with each other, which is like in a big church congregation. And this is what makes the gifts the Oktoberfest a kind of spiritual quality, is what I write. Because a lot of people don't explain that, but they feel it. In the interviews, people said, this is like in church, this is like divine, this is like heaven, this is like ecstatic, uplifting, fantastic, great. So it's like you said, in a football stadium, there's a big difference from a football stadium. So because in a football stadium, the people will want to win against the other team. It's always a winning, losing situation, in a football game. Mm -hmm. The mass needs a collective goal, says Elias Canetti and Freud. 
The collective goal is in a football game to win over the other team. In the case of the Oktoberfest, the collective goal is having fun together. It's a festivity. So there's no goal against each other. The goal is being together, having fun in a group. Mm -hmm. So on the Oktoberfest, hardly ever there's been like a, a stampede or anything like this. Never happened. Right. They did have fighting situations in old times. People used to be more, what do you call this in English? Like Raufen, like in the Wild West movies. Or a rave dance other. would be similar then too. Everyone yes. kind of dancing to the same electronic <laughs> yes. beat, the, a fast And they're all moving to this, yeah, right. Like you see the Burning Man or you see like, uh, you know, the Love Parade, which used to happen in Berlin. Anything that's collective and having the goal of being a festivity, it's like a peaceful kind of mass movement that, ends in a, in, a, in, a, in a big, exciting festival. And a soundtrack to go with it, be it chanting or singing or yes. drumming or uh, whatever. There's, yeah, there's a sonic background drive. Well, and the, and the, the sound is very important. I come to the rhythm and the stuff with the ritual part of it. So what individuals seek in a mass is according to Freud and Al Kennedy, anonymity, because in the beer tent, it's interesting, Nobody knows you, so you can do anything. You can spill your beer, you can kiss a woman you don't know, <laughs> you can dance with a guy you've never seen, you can, you know, be funny, silly, something. So it's like nobody can point a finger at you and say, you did this yesterday because there's tens of thousands. So this was very important for a lot of people saying, I can do here what I like to do. It's a freedom of being excited and wild and different, which I couldn't do in my village. So this is a really big reason for a lot of people to enjoy this. Well, and losing your individual identity to merge with a group is part of yes. that transition. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what you're explaining. This is exactly what it is. It's spontaneous community with people you don't have never seen before. Like you start hugging, you start, what do you call this? This chunking, the swaying, they hook each other's arms and they go like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. This sounds like a little bit old fashioned, but the thing is, if you do this a lot with people sitting next, right and left to you, you feel like a family after some time, you know, you feel really connected to these people after two, three hours. And affiliation, it's also like making new friends, feeling close, feeling warm and together and, and, and sharing the same drink and food and uh, fun, you know. And it's a temporary sense of belonging because often after the Oktoberfest is over, you're lost again without contact. You don't really have, people don't sometimes share a phone number or address or something, but often it's only related to this moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Munich, this is interesting, in the beer tents, there are, what do you call this in America? I don't know. In Bavaria, they call it a Stammtisch. A Stammtisch is a place in a, in a pub where on a certain table, a certain group of people meet once a week uh, as a regular kind of get together. Mm. What do you call this in English? I don't know. Um, it's a very perverse. I don't know that we have a single word for it. I mean, you know, the single table where everybody meets once a week or whatever. It's kind of a meeting. I don't know, your regulars? I don't know. Your regular table. Yeah, yeah. regular. Okay. In, um, in Germany, it's very important. Barry, it's called the Stammtisch. And the Stamm comes from the word stem, from the tree stem. It's the, the table like a stem. So it's where you sit, like on a tree thing. And it's reliable. They're there every Wednesday, for example. And they always meet. And this is something in bars and restaurants. On the Oktoberfest, there are Stammtisch. Nobody knows this if you're a tourist. In the beer tents that only exist 16 days each year, people mm -hmm. have a tendency to have a Stammtisch. That means you go to a certain table, you know your waitress, you know these guys that come there, and for 16 days, they sit at the same table with the same guys drinking the same beer, and they don't meet each other at all for the rest of the year. They only <laughs> meet at the Stammtisch. And you see you. You see the guys again the next year when the Oktoberfest comes back. This is very interesting. I've it never is. seen this in any, in any other German festival. This is very typical here. And you would only uncover that through your interviews. Yeah. Of course, because I'm from Northern Bavaria. I didn't even know about the Stammtisch. I learned about it myself, asking people what they did there. And they said, this is a Stammtisch. I said, wow, in a beer tent. I've never seen this. So it's very traditional. So the Oktoberfest has a different kind of tradition for the locals. And of course, a tourist won't even, only by coincidence, find out about this because they're not part of the Stammtisch. So it's a different kind of groups, how they experience the Oktoberfest. And talking about the mass, this is what it looks like on a Saturday or a Sunday. Oh my. Look at this. <laughs> I mean, with Corona and distancing, you couldn't imagine this anymore. It's very strange. So this is a regular Oktoberfest weekend um, with good weather. This is what it looks like, you know, lots of people on a dense space. It's like I said, half a million in one day. This is a beer tent. This is my favorite beer tent without people. 
Mm -hmm. I, I took this photo so you see it's the empty ritual space for the big crowd. This is uh -huh. the Broil Rosal tent. See the bandstand in the middle? This is where the band plays. Uh -huh. And this is like where the tables are and you have a little, and there's an inside part and there's a little outside part here. This is where the more expensive tables are. You can reserve tables. And this is a little bit more, you know, nicer and more away. This is the celebrating mass here. And outside there's a little bit more cozy and distance from the mass. Yeah. But this is when it's filled up. It's a big thing. There's a lot going on. So this is like a tent before it, this is the festival starts. And it's rather cathedral-like too. For those... Yes, what I mean. That's what I mean. It's like a cathedral in a way that's this big setup. And I come to talk about it later again. The guy who controls the festival in a way, like the priest of the festival, is the guy who is the director of the band. Because uh, the man who is the director of the band, he mm -hmm. uh, controls the music if it's fast or slow or exciting or if they repeat this process, their gemütlichkeit kind of ritual. So the guy on the bandstand sort of or is the leader of the festival because he makes the music. And he they decides what recitation is going to happen for the group and then directs it. Yeah. Yeah, in a way. Okay. So he's not installed as a priest or as the leader of the festival, but by, by nature, he's the guy who makes he's the music. That kind of, yeah. uh, controlling the whole situation, actually. Just... And this is, you see the whole, the lederhosen thing. This is like a picture from like four years, three or four years ago. You see everybody's wearing these, almost everybody's having lederhosen, the short ones, the gentle dresses. Pinks uh -huh. were in, men wear pink uh, in blouses and shirts and stuff. So the blue and the pink is very much the color people like. Interesting. So you see these guys in Lederhosen here, they all look the same here. Sort of. <laughs> so this is like, uh, yeah, it, it's like a uniform now. It's funny, you know, it starts being a uniform. Yeah. Ecstasy. Here we go. The ecstasy or the intoxicative uh, feeling, the uh, euphoria is induced by beer, of course. But over and overstimulation by music, lights, and movement. So it's the beer, but also it's very, you know, there's a lot of music. Every tent, every ride has its own music and light show. And a movement is like rhythm, dancing. People dance in the streets sometimes. Their movement is also jumping on the benches. You're not supposed to get up on the tables, but if they get excited, they go up on the benches and start jumping in the rhythm, swaying, stuff like this makes you dizzy and gets you in the ecstatic feeling. Uh -huh. The Oktoberfest ecstasy is called the Wiesenrausch. This is a, a, a standing phrase in Germany. The Wiesenrausch means the Oktoberfest rush, rausch, ec ecstatic euphoria. This is not only connected to beer consumption. So mm -hmm. if I ask people on the Oktoberfest, they say, no, I don't need a beer to get in this Wiesenrausch. I get it anyway by just being there, by I you know, see being that. part of the festival and the bigness, the size of it, and the colorful people of all you know different art parts of Germany and the world. What the, what the interviewed people answered was the most important thing was letting go, feeling detached from their regular lives, of course, like in any detached, uh, intoxicated feeling, I guess, feeling more free, floating and being different from what they know. Mm -hmm. So you could say any drug does this, yeah, of course, any drug does this. But it's interesting that a festival like the Oktoberfest does this to people without taking a drug. So it's, it's just being in this group of enormous density of people that this happens i mean well, I we're know all this. about uh, ecstasy without drugs <laughs> so we know yeah, that so i've about. been going there so many times and uh, working on my thesis i couldn't drink of course I, I couldn't drink beer because i had to be sober in my mind but i felt carried away anyway by this feeling of the oktoberfest without having alcohol inside yeah. and on top of this you can have alcohol free beer you can go do the whole festival without beer it's no problem they have water and coke. And enjoy it fully, yeah. And of course, intoxication can lead to collapse. Of those people who don't uh, know how to ride the wave of the Oktoberfest, they might collapse after this. So I, I put this picture because it's a really typical picture of a woman serving this beer. And you see, she's kind of a goddess, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's so pretty and she has this hoof beer here. And the interesting thing is, this is back to the ritual vessel. I found ritual vessels in a book of ancient Egypt where the mother goddess is holding a vessel in front of her breasts, serving oh. a holy drink. And the, the vessel is in front of the woman being served like this. Uh -huh. And in Munich, it's very interesting. I interviewed men, Munich, uh, original Bavarians who said, I want my beer being served by a woman. 
And I said, why is this? Because they do have male waiters. There are waiters around. And I said, no, the beer is related to women. And I want it served like in front of the chest like this. <laughs> it sounds very odd. But if you look at the old people, uh, maybe I have the image. I don't know how to find it. I think it goes back to ancient times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't know if I find the picture. Now I have this in one of those books that the mother goddess has the beer in front of her chest. He, so she serves the drink. Well, this is not a very good image, but you know what I mean? She doesn't have a breast here. But you see this? Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You see the libation a... vessels held up in a lot of statues. Yep. Yeah. Right. Well, she doesn't right. have a chest there, but they have these images like they look like a mother goddess with a with a with the, the chest visible so much with a ves vessel in front of the chest. Yeah, yes, the vessel in front of the chest. This is what it is. And see these these Bavarian men. They say it is not because they are archaeologically they don't have a study. They just feel this is mm. how it should be. It's like yes. a, you know, it's like Makes a sense. feeling. It should be this way. This is how it's supposed to be. I think we're tapping into some ancestral memories. Here. I would choose her over a male. <laughs> yeah. So would I. Yeah. And this is like, uh -huh. <laughs> this is like the beer mugs, and uh, this is like the ritual vessel. That every ritual needs a vessel. And this is like it's become the vessel of the Oktoberfest. This one liter kind of thing. Um, well, you can find okay. cups, mugs with handles, even in uh, Mesa Verde. Uh, that had served chocolate in other uh, <laughs> ritual well, brews. One very interesting thing, I have discovered a very interesting thing just a few um, two weeks ago. There's a very important exhibit on Celtic excavations in Constance at the Lake of Constance in the south of Germany. And they had excavated a Celtic <coughs> grave long, long time ago. I, don't, I forgot how long ago that was. It was before maybe 1000 before Jesus or something. I don't remember when that was. Anyway, they excavated a, a, a big keg, and the keg was filled up with 300 liters of drink. 300 liters in a keg. It was a really <laughs> amphoric thing they dug out. And wow. it was a king's grave, and he had these big kind of buckets. It was, looked like buckets out of uh, bronze. And these buckets were like um, a dishes to drink out of, and one bucket held three liters. It's like almost a gallon, right? Wow. Like for people to drink with each other, they had gallon-sized uh, drinking vessels at the time. So that would be implied to be shared, right? Pass it around your small group. Maybe or not. But I, I think they drank the, 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 themselves the gallon, I guess, <laughs> these guys uh -huh. at the time. So it was like a 300, <laughs> it was a 300 liter keg and like eight of those drinking vessels that they put in the grave with this kind of uh, kingly mm -hmm. person. And so it must have been his kind of drinking set or something. It's amazing, like a pitcher, you know, you drink yourself. You wanted to bring Which it to the like, afterlife, I think. Three yeah. times as big as this one. Wow. The vessel oh, wow. is three times bigger than this one. I think it's amazing. How would you even lift it <laughs> to put it to your mouth? Well, they had like handles uh, you could put like this. Yeah, double handles. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, double handles. So you see, this is also part of the exciting intoxication thing. They have merry-go-rounds and colors. So this puts you in a state of trance if you do that more than once. Flashing lights moving fast, yes. A lot. Transducing, very, yeah, very, strobe light yeah, effect, yeah, yes. yes. Lights, music, a flashing oh. lights, it all does it to you. Mm -hmm. So now we come to the ritual. Yeah, it's, it's at all clear why it's a ritual. These ritual aspects I've picked out of a book saying this is the, how you say it, the criteria for a, a festive ritual. This is what Elias Kennedy is writing. So a ritual space needs to be there, it's, which is the Theresian visa, this place of 104 acres, including the tents, of course, and all that's on it. So this is a ritual space. And clear yeah, boundaries to it, yep. Yeah, a few boundaries. Usually the Theresian visa is not closed up. It, it, it is a certain space, but it's open to the sides normally. Mm -hmm. So you can go away if you want, you can come in if you like. So it's, it, it used to be very open coming in and out. Uh, let's see how they do it next time. I don't know about this corona. This might change a lot. So we will see about this. So the ritual dress is now dental dresses for women and later hosen for men. This is like if you dress in style, it's supposed to be like this. It's a ritual dress. You have a ritual vessel. This is the one liter steins, what I've show, been showing you here. It's either the crook of, of glass or it's a stein that you cannot look inside. You have a ritual drink. It's of course the Oktoberfest beer. You have ritual food, and the ritual food is the beer. You have the pretzels like this here. 
and mm. the chicken. This is like the, the basic food is like this. This kind of pretzel bread and the chickens used to be the traditional food. Now you get all the kind of food on your Oktoberfest. They started being really chic. You have like three star cooks and you have like anything from roast beef to whatever. I mean, you can buy anything to chocolate mousse and stuff from France. So which is a little getting out of hand, I guess. But in old times, the pretzel, the chicken and the beer was the favorite. And they do have, I didn't write this down, they have these gingerbread hearts. Ah. And they have the writing on it. So this is a typical Toberfest heart. So if a guy is in love with me, he will give me the heart and I'll wear it like here. So like <laughs> and so everybody's proud if they have a, a friend, a husband, a lover, somebody who gives you this because it's a sign of friendship. And this heart says, She does does the gift this heart. It's nice that you're in this world. Nice that you're in this world. In yeah. this world right? So they have all these uh, little love kind of it's, it's like a love Valentine's. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's a love symbol. Then you have the music. Ritual music in a way is the reason hits. This is the Oktoberfest hit songs that they have created over the years, which are pop hits. I mean, like Take Me Home Country Roads is not a traditional Bavarian song, but it's made it into the hit. It's always songs you can sing along well. And mm -hmm. it's most important if you look at the songs, you find out that they have certain themes that re are repetitive. I always question myself, why do they use the song in the Oktoberfest? Answer is this. First of all, a lot of songs are romantic has a lot to do with belonging to your home, like take me home country roads to the place I belong. This is very romantic. The guy who sings the song wants to go back to West Virginia. So the Bavarians want to go back to the mountains or their homeland or whatever. So it's a very romantic kind of thing to long back to your origin. Then there's a lot of love songs like men and women, you want to go with me, you want to love me and so on. So this love song uh, attitude is there. There's a lot of, um, longing for better times kind of songs like this is one song that you wouldn't know this it's called sierra madre and the sierra madre is a, a, a piece of um a mountain range in mexico in southern mexico right and uh nobody has ever been there <laughs> i'm sure from here <laughs> but this this song is called sierra madre and they sing how the eagle how the eagle flies or, or, or the vulture flies and how the sun rises and goes down this very romantic village in south of mexico nobody knows if it's ever so romantic over there but it's it's this kind of you want to wish yourself away from your hard life at home and you create these fantastic places you might want to go so sierra madre is a it's an october fest song that it's not known in america i'm sure but it's just one of those, you know, longing kind of songs. And then you have a rhythm spirit also, uh, you know, yeah. but say again. Oh, I said spirit journey. Yeah. Yes. So it's like wishing for a better place to be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the songs have the idea of being uplifted. What do you say? Spirit journey. It's about flying. It's about being light and uplifted and mm -hmm. losing ground and stuff. So there's a lot of these longing songs that make people lighter, flying, taking off. Like when it's a transcendence. Body. Yeah. Yeah, and this is like the trance ritual, the transcending your body and being away. This is also part of the songs, uh, what they, the, the words, the, the the words for the songs, and the ritual movement, of course. And the ritual movement is not dancing because dancing is still prohibited after these many years, but it's the shunkel, the swaying shunkel is what they call it, and the jumping on the benches. So people start doing this rhythm on the benches. You have these benches on the tables, and there's maybe eight people on a bench, and they start jumping and swaying on this bench. It's a little dangerous sometimes, but this is what they do to get into their mood. Mm -hmm. And here you see this collective drinking. It makes you, it's an old tradition to, to, to share your bread and your drink. You know, it's a communion. That's what it is. Yeah, bread this, and this wine. This is like one of my, my keywords in my thesis is the Oktoberfest is a communion in a festival that could be in a church if it was spiritual. So you share the yeah. beer, you share the, the, the bread and you share this. Because they have very big ones, you could they're five times bigger than this one here. And so you share your drink. And if somebody's there without a beer in their mug, people will come and say, you don't have a beer? I give you one. And they give them. So it's like they really actually share the food and the beer. They share the bread. They share the beer. So it's like in a church service, actually. It has to do with a communion. And um, this anthropologist Turner writes about it. Oh, the sharing of food and drink. Yeah. unite a, a tribe to be a, a family you know to belong together mm -hmm. and this is the ritual food there you see it's the chicken and it's the pretzel it's a big one it's a big pretzel that are lying down there and it's a beer this is exactly the oktoberfest traditional food 
way. And people even, they eat this with their fingers. The chicken is eaten with the hands. They don't even use the fork and the knives. Mm -hmm. And people even share this. If they you don't have a thing, you take a piece. So this is something nobody would do in a restaurant. To have anybody grabbing your plate and share your chicken. But on your <laughs> toilet, first they do it. Yes. Yeah, she might do this. <laughs> but with people you don't know, you don't do this. But on the Oktoberfest, it turns into a family. It turns into a family ritual. It's, it's a communion. It's to a share sign of family. intimacy as well, isn't it? Yeah. It's very interesting that people, and you don't know these guys on the table when you come and your best friends, when you leave and you share your food and drink with them. This is what this festival does to people. There's the music. I just picked those guys. They are sitting in a beer. The Oktoberfest does have beer gardens too. It's not just in the tents. They have gardens around the beer tents and they sit there sometimes making their own little music. So this guy's playing traditional Bavarian music. And this is, like I said, dancing is prohibited. <laughs> but yeah, but in the traditional part of the Oktoberfest, they have traditional dances. They have show dances. It sounds like the, it looks like they're twirling like a whirling dervish. Yeah. yeah, they're twirling. And this is also why I show this. This is a very traditional shoe plot. Like, so the guys clap their hands and they, they, they clap their hands. Also, they hit them on the on the calves and on the feet. And the women keep turning like dervish spinning. It's very difficult to do because I get dizzy with this. And it's a, a certain kind of, you know, traditional dance from the villages. It's very rhythmic and very trance-like also, you know. I, so it's I, very I, um, part of this. And they have these show dances on the, his, the historic part of the Oktoberfest. And look how they brought nature in with the boughs, the greenery. Um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of the Oktoberfest. There's a lot of green everywhere and decoration. So it's this very nicely decorated tents, very lots of flowers, lots of uh, natural things. So and you see the old dances. This is like ancient, you know. Make it up to the Oktoberfest to be enjoyed by the public. Well, addiction. I don't want to go too deep into this, but addiction is part of the Oktoberfest because, first of all, a lot of people say the Oktoberfest is an addiction, the festival itself. So if people in Munich say the Oktoberfest is on and they say, I'm, I want to go there once, they end up going there five times. <laughs> and I say, I want to go there 10 times, I end up going 16 times, right? So it's it like, it sucks you in. There's some quality about it. It's so exciting meeting these people and being in this kind of trance-like, colorful, music, music kind of setting that you like, you know, basically sucked into it. It's like, it pulls you there. So people will say they long for this feeling of community. This is what brings them back all the time. The overstimulation in an exceptional situation is what can be addictive. It's this trance kind of state of being in a different kind of mind and spiritual mm -hmm. kind of context here. The state of euphoria wants to be, wants a repetition. But people seek euphoria. And this is what Friedrich Nietzsche says, one of my favorite German philosophers, all joy wants eternity. Uh, one of my favorite sentences he ever said, all joy wants eternity. Oh, I'm noting that down. That's it. Yeah. So it means uh, Nietzsche was very much involved in writing about the Apollo kind of quality of the Greek gods and the Dion Dionysus quality of the Greek gods. You know, Dionysus, the god of drink and beer and wine and intoxication. Oh, yes. Yep. Dionys Dionysus? Dionysus. Dionysus. This is how you Yeah. Dionysus and Apollo, right. So in Nietzsche, I refer to him a lot in my book. He wrote these exquisite articles about Apollo being the god of melody and the mind and the the thinking and the structure and the melody, but Dionysus being the god of rhythm and the stomping on the floor and the intoxication and the drink and the song and Dionysus is this god with the you know with the vine leaves in his head and having women follow him dancing in the forest uh, out of outside of the Greek town of Athens so Dionysus lives in nature he's a nature god well Apollo used to be the city god of the city of Athens he used to be the state god and in Greek, at a certain time, the Greeks had to introduce this Dionysus into their culture because people wanted this. They wanted the intoxicating dancing god. And, and there's a lot of books written about Dionysus. He's very much related to Shiva in Hinduism. And Shiva is the god of dance and ecstasy and transition and what do you call it, transformation. And there's connections between the idea of Shiva as a god of trance and dance and Dionysus being a god of trance and dance. They're very much related. 
And there were so, muses uh, among the Greek for women and song and dance and rhythm and proportion. Yeah. The Greek rhythm is very intoxicating. I mean, I learned how to Greek Greek dances, folk dances, and the Greek rhythm is very much trance-like. If you dance Greek dances a longer time, it takes you to another space in a way. It's very interesting the way they dance. Yeah, it's very ancient. So, and this is what Nietzsche describes a lot in his books. And uh, this is where I got a lot of theories out of about the Apollo and the Dionys Dionysus story, yeah. which well, and dancing Dionysus, around the Maypole, right? Another fertility. Dance. Say again. Oh, dancing around the maypole, another old yeah, folk yes, tradition. Yes, yes. This is yep. this is very uh, opaque and, and it's still done in Germany also on first of May. Yeah. So this guy survived the Oktoberfest. That's what he thinks, right? <laughs> I survived. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing is, on his T-shirt, there's a guy lying with the muck in his hand, and he does the same thing. That's why I took this. <laughs> And he's lying there for the October 29th. He has this mug and he's lying there totally, you know, done. And yeah. this is exactly what happened to him there. Yeah. Well, well, this is part of too much drinking. Yeah, well, the coming. collapse is a common state. Like when you have the San Bushmen dance their dance and do their healing ritual, they collapse at the end. They've yeah. spent all their energy. They have, they, they, yeah. That's true, but beer has a different... Uh, yeah, I know, yeah, I, but it's, yeah. you know, I'm trying to draw some parallels. And look at, I'm you... not so sure these guys have a healing, healing, had a healing approach. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. <laughs> yeah. There's a place behind the tents that's on a little hillside that's where everybody's lying around being intoxicated and they can't walk anymore. But the interesting thing is that the Bavarian people, who the traditional folk, they say, if you want to enjoy the Oktoberfest, you have to write... They say this you have to ride the rouse you have to be master of the intoxication you have to be master mm -hmm. of the trance because if you master it you drink enough to be intoxicated and happy and floating but not enough yeah. to collapse gotcha. and they always laugh at people sorry from other countries that come here or italians especially they come and drink two mugs like this and they fall down and lie around like this and the very insane the yeah. Bavarians say they don't understand the festival, that they, they miss it because they don't they drink enough too much in one. And uh, I talk to Bavarian men, they say they, they drink like this, a real beer, and then they drink one muck without alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then they said, I can ride the Rausch, I can ride this intoxication, I can be in this strong state for like six hours and longer. So right. they sort of have a technique to work with this. And they say falling under the table would be the worst thing to happen. They say they want to enjoy this ecstasy and not collapse. So this is the, the trick not to collapse if you... Well, and also finessing like tiny sips throughout a long period rather than gulping. The point being just to enjoy the, yeah. The point is being happy, uplifted, uh, you know, flying, floating in your space without, you know, collapsing. The, the collapsing is the end of it. And then you lost it. This is what they say. So. They're very proud of very wise yeah yeah organizing this differently in their lives not everybody can manage it people fall down and drink too much but the smart ones say i can handle this without you know falling off the table here off the, off the chairs okay so the cultural event in a way is first of all what people answer i said i said this before the longing for tradition and the feeling of heimat of belonging to your homeland this is like very bavarian the dress the beard the, the food, it's all very related to feeling Bavarian here, especially the dress. There's a guy which called Michel Maffesoli, is a professor for social, social uh, what do you call it? Uh, sociology. Sociology, sorry. Yes. Sociology in France. He's in Paris. And he wrote very, very fascinating books about the importance of Dionysus, Dionysus in our times. So he, uh -huh. wrote, he wrote a book called, I think it's called Dionysus Reborn or something like this. Yeah. So he wrote many books. I think they're in English. Uh, I wrote, I read them in English, actually. He's writing in French. And he writes that our times need a new affiliation in postmodern times where people are so diverse in their lives and everybody's working at home office and online and you don't meet your friends anymore. Everybody's on a, on a laptop or on a mobile phone. So he says effective new tribal structures are coming back in a communal way. So people want community, they want excitement, they want to belong. And new tribalism is something that uh, uh, he calls it that way, that people come together in a kind of a tribal construction, they belong to a group, they do things together, 
but then they fall apart again. It's not a group that's bound together by birth or by, by bloodline or anything. So you could say that the people in the beer tent have a new tribal character while they're in the beer tent on this table and celebrating together. They're building this community of you love each other, you like each other, you're totally excited and sharing everything. But as soon as it's this over, they disperse again and are gone. Yeah. And he says this is what he sees in modern times, like, you know, be it soccer or football games or be it whatever, the love parade or carnival. People come together in these really tight, emotional, you know, sharing groups of excitement. Mm -hmm. And then after it's gone, done, it's done. So they, they, they switch to the next group. It's not related like in old times to a, a upbringing in a village or your background in a tribe. That's but what a wonderful way for us to expand our community, even if only temporarily, yeah. to really um, communicate on some deep level with many, many, many other people and groups. So, need so this is repetitive now. I, I, yeah, I said this before, like, Dunland Lederhosen became a ritual for us since about the mid-90s. Uh, interesting enough, there's more younger visitors since to, about 2004. It, it had a really big boom of young people. This had to happen, this, this had to do with the mobile phones. In old times, people didn't have mobile phones, so nobody could tell his friends, come on over here, it's great. So you went there and you stayed there. But now they started this mobile phone communication coming in more. And so there was this incredible boom of young people going to the Oktoberfest for a while because they typed in their you know, messengers, come on over, this is great. So it was very strange because a lot of these young people, they come out of clubs and discotheques. They are not so much related to the Oktoberfest ritual. The Oktoberfest used to be a place, I would say till, you know, about 20 years ago, where the middle range people go a lot. I mean, between 30 and 60 or something like this in the middle middle of their, their lives. Some older folks and of course, families and kids, but the young uh, party crowd would not come to the Oktoberfest. For them, this was too traditional, actually. They never really showed up so much. But it, there was this boom of people coming in the, you know, 20 years ago almost, yeah. We were just flooding the Oktoberfest with young kids and they just wanted party and action. And it took away a little bit from the old traditions, but they're gone again, interesting enough. They liked this for a while and then now they dispersed again. So it's <laughs> settling back to where it was. Yeah, they, they had this kind of, uh, you know, it yeah. was a fashion trend. You see them. Yeah. So oh, this has been fascinating, Brigitte. Uh, so, and really to drill last, down. I think we have to stop, right? But this is like a, just a few pictures. This is like the big Ferris wheel that's typical there. This is the Bavarian flag. You see this everywhere, the blue and white flag. This is like for Bavaria here, right? Uh, this is like traditional costumes again. I just show <laughs> a few more pictures. Yeah. And this is like uh, one of those traditional, you know, this thing you, you, you have to hit it with a hammer. What do you call this? It's how they look at, it's a, it's a long oh. stick. And you try to and get the ball to the ring at the top. You have to hit this thing with a hanger. Yeah. And this thing flies up to the ring at the top. Yeah, this is like to show your male strength. It's very a masculine kind of show here. <laughs> right. And this is a guy oh, pretending to be Dionysus, right? With the hop wreath. He made this himself. So you see people dress up for the occasion and he made this. And I've seen him more than once. He goes every year looking like this. Uh-huh. Like this the green the man revived. Yeah. Yeah, this is Bavaria. This is the statue of Bavaria, the goddess over overriding the festival. She's like the goddess of drink and beer in this case, I think. And this is the last, I had to bring this quote of Nietzsche saying, and those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear them. Mm. Oh, beautiful. Wow. And this is great because people who don't understand the Oktoberfest think everybody's gone mad over there. It's all crazies but they don't hear the music. They don't know what it is. They don't understand the rhythm and the magic of it. It's really magic. Yeah, oh, I can use that quote a lot. <laughs> that applies to so many things. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So Nietzsche wrote a, uh, wrote a lot about an, an, an ecstasy and uh, Dionysus, and he knew it. I mean, he understood this kind of thing. So he was really fantastic. Did you write yeah. that down? I can send it to you. Oh, no, it's wrote it down. That's a good one. So, and this is like my last thing. This is what I what I did about it. I wrote this one book and I wrote the Wiesenwahnsinn. This is another book written in German. This is one, uh, the second book I wrote about the Oktoberfest, Wiesenwahnsinn. Oh. And the funny thing is, these are quotes and dialogues from the beer tables. I started collecting what people talk about 
and I made a book out of these dialogues, what they talk. And it's very funny what comes out of it. So it's like uh, overheard conversations. Overheard, like, look at this guy. It's very funny. He, he has this food. There's a guy who won this huge tiger. We, yeah, we can see it better that. if we stop the screen share. Then we can see you full screen and we it's can okay. see it better. So yeah. this is what uh, what I did, and I, I also made a a, a, little, a a theater comedy out of it. The Wiesn Mountain was a, a stage play, also. Oh, and wow. thank you for listening to me, and so I stopped the sharing. You know. Oh, uh, really me. fascinating and insightful. You know, we were wondering how. I mean, we we're wondering when you read about some of these very ancient communal festivals and what they were celebrating, um, and you wonder what were they like and. Uh, what's their equivalent? And you have detailed the Oktoberfest. You've analyzed it to demonstrate that this is still alive. This is a mm -hmm. instinct or a need or a fulfillment of something deep within us that it gets expressed in these various ways. And it, it may... continues through time. So, Hi, Robert. Oh, who are I'm you just seeing a friend. I'm just seeing a friend here who's been to the Oktoberfest with me. That's Robert on the... Oh. Hello. Hello. Very good. Hi there. There you go. You got a mask like me. Look, yeah. Robert. Let's cheer across here. <laughs> Florida. My greetings. Oh. He, he knows the Oktoberfest really well. He's been here more than once, knowing it all. Thank you. Oh, well, we're going to take uh, comments. Um, yeah, absolutely. Comments we can do that. In fact, Cameron typed in a question. There. Can you read that one? Yeah. Right? I also want to talk to Leslie uh, Zara, Afterwards. So, okay. Um, you want? Okay, Cameron. You why don't you speak it up? Oh. Okay. I just made a comment that, um, and uh, this not well. First and foremost, I love what you, Rich wrote. It's really cool. I really like it a lot. All right. I especially thought some of your arguments about <laughs> the calves were kind of neat. That it's a, a really interesting argument for uh, evolutionary uh, psychology, by the way. Um, but uh, one of the questions I had was, as far as what I'm seeing, I see the ritualization, the libations, and all that. We talk about Oktoberfest. Uh, what I don't see is a supernatural premise, all right, for what you're arguing from an anthropological okay. standpoint of view. But I mean, have you looked very carefully into uh, Sibel, the goddess statue that you have in Munich, the uh, the uh, uh, the goddess of Bavaria statue you have, and the connection that she has within Greek and Roman mythology regarding uh, alcohol and regarding uh, uh, harvest festivals and uh, direct comparison between her and Dionysus and how they were opposite each other, kind of doing something very similar things. Not to mention the fact Munich is sitting in the middle of the mountains or near mountain mountain areas, all right? And she's the, considered the goddess of the mountain. So I kind of wonder if that was maybe perhaps have anything to do with this at all for looking at that supernatural premise that perhaps you're looking for here. Just an idea. Thank you, Cam. Yeah. Thanks, Cam. Yeah. Thank you for the question. But the thing is that, of course, the the since the Oktoberfest got set up as a wedding, and nobody really created this as a ritual festival of some any any beer goddess or anything. This is a, totally unconscious. So That's the good. funny thing is, it's a very Catholic country, and they would never allow a beer goddess on any kind of Oktoberfest because the Catholic Church is in here. So they say you celebrate your beer festival, and we do our communion in the church. So me saying that the Oktoberfest is a communion in a way of unconscious kind of communion of breaking the bread, drinking the intoxicating drink, sharing your group at the table, becoming one body of people in a beer tent. Mm -hmm. It's my interpretation by seeing this festival happening over the last 30 years and say, this is what it is. It's a community, it's religious. It's, it has a, a sacred kind of background basically, but it does not have a priest or a priestess. It's not installed officially, that's the point. It's still a beer festival. But, yes. by the people, but by the people say unconscious need to relate and to come together, it is it has a spiritual meaning to it. And only those who understand can perceive that. It's not an officially spiritual place. And this is why the goddess of Bavaria, what I call the goddess there, it's not a goddess. It's just a statue that the king put there because he, he wanted a city goddess. He wanted something like Athena. Mm -hmm. But... You know, this is 150 years later. People don't understand this consciously anymore. And I see your point, but this was not constructed consciously. It happened 
it's an unconscious happening that it's people can grow. Yeah. It's organic. It happened. Yeah. So it's not by will. It's not by will. Well, well and it's what we, you, coming back to your very original comment that you know people are looking for community. People are looking to belong to the homeland. That there is something deep within our that is looking for that connection. And so whether we do it through we find we find it through this vehicle of of uh, Oktoberfest or other means, there's this that deep thing looking for it. And and and. And so it would make sense that it, it would it would evolve into something much more than what the original thing was. First a wedding, then it was this, and then it was that. And well, the and, elements that came together were pulled from some deep place that felt being a psychologist right is and what that you're saying. functioned right. according to our physiology and our deep. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't, I can't child. possibly see that as an accident at all. I right. can't possibly see that as an accident. I don't. I mean, there's so many. Uh, is there's so many different details here yeah. that yeah. are so i mean the sabel statue that's obviously sabel she's standing there with a lion all right that yeah. is uh, uh that is that is it's 11th tarot uh, 11th picture of the tarot it's the uh she literally represents strength all right and you talk about the aspect of how the Oktoberfest, in many ways Born people don't get it because they end up getting so drunk they can't stand, right? This is, an, 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 in effect, a test of strength in many ways. And you continue to keep standing there and doing this over this entire period of time, drinking. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I see this. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm completely taking it the wrong way. My, my grandfather's I, I don't think parents, you're far off. Yeah. My grandfather's parents came from Strasbourg, all right, which is not exactly in Germany. It's in alsace right? And they had Oktoberfest there, too. And uh, it wasn't as prominent as I'm sure it is in Bavaria. But uh, what I do remember about talking about this, something that you had mentioned is very similar to seeing how people would come from different areas and they start drinking and lose their bloody minds and not understand this is a marathon, not a race, not, not, not a race to the <laughs> analogy. You know. Yeah. But uh, uh, again, I, I just, uh, all the symbols seem to me to be really representative of. Uh, an idea to, that's something completely not Dionysus in his, ba in his nature, but more nature of uh, showing uh, the strength of the, the people there. Like and, fertility. And the fertility you know, and the, harvest uh, everything festival. go along with that. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's just my you're comment. celebrating the harvest of the grains. You're celebrating exactly. the right time of year. Exactly. You're celebrating the yeah. abundance. And also, beer was very nutritious. Beer was celebrated because it was a way to preserve the crops. People were starting to grow grains and hybridize grains. Now they needed a way to make it last all year. Bread was part of that process, and beer was the fermentation of soaking the grain and putting it into loaves and a way to preserve the nutrients. My niece was actually told to, when she was pregnant, to drink um, Guinness because it was full of nutrients, not not too excess. But she was, but her German doctor, when her husband was stationed over there, oh. uh, and she lived over there during her her pregnancy, she, she, I was like, really? Yes, it's nutritious. Um, so it was a whole, it's a whole different attitude towards. Uh, Laura, thank you on. for making my, yeah. my argument. Appreciate it. That, that's what <laughs> I'm going with this. Well, right. even if it's subconscious, you, even if you, a community comes together and says, uh, let's put these elements together because they fit, they resonate with something deep within, that's your whole argument, Brigitta. Yes, yes, uh, yes. That you're saying. The thing is, um, of course, the Oktoberfest is, was set in October, not because because it's maybe the last chance to celebrate before the winter comes, of course. Yeah. And But there was just a, a just, just very profane reason for it. The king's grandfather had his name day, Max, on October 12th. This is why they picked the wedding October 12th to honor the, the grandfather king, the king oh, grandfather. Okay. Yeah. At the same time, this is exactly the time in Bavaria now that it's still warm. You could still celebrate outside. And I was outside at the lake today. You could still swim today and have a beer and sit in the open. It was still fairly tem yeah. good temperatures in the weather. So this is the last chance to celebrate before the winter comes in this latitude. Well, it's... So of course, all the yeah. harvest festivals, all the Celt festivals, all the Celtic, all the traditional will have their last chance to come together, celebrate, find a spouse for the winter, whatever, now. If you don't meet any, Nietzsche used to say, Friedrich Nietzsche used to say, uh, no, it was Rilke, you know, uh, the poet Rilke from Germany said something in a poet, if you don't find a spouse now, you're going to have a long, lonely winter, right? <laughs> well, okay, so, so in the spring, you celebrate 
uh, nature waking up and the new shoots coming up yeah. and beginning. In the uh, fall, you celebrate the harvest, right? You've grown, you've grown it, let's harvest it. And in the winter, the depth of winter, you celebrate the return of the light. So all those symbols, we're going to have a mythologist on the Sunday before Thanksgiving to explain the deep rituals that have morphed from ancient times and through Christianity, adapting those and maybe desecularizing them a little bit. Um, but he's going to explain our three main holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. Um, so I think it's important to understand the deep impulses that arise and express themselves in these communal ways with their mythos and their rituals. It's beautiful I mean, what you've done, Brigitte. Yeah. On this there's one. a lot of underlying symbolism, I think, also yeah. in the goddess Bavaria. The lion is the state symbol of the state of, in the coat of arms of Bavaria. And uh, she wanted, she was supposed to look like a Athena. They wanted to make her look like a Greek goddess. Yeah. First, I seen the first drafts of the statue, and then they decided it was too Greek. This didn't fit. So they said, we have to do a German thing. So she has an oak wreath instead of laurel. She has a lion and she um, was holding the sword up before she was like a war goddess. And then they made her hold the sword down. Now the sword's down and she holds the wreath of peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has a bear skin on, like yeah. it's very German. Uh, the bear and the lion is not German, but it's a Bavarian kingly symbol. So of course, you're right about this. There's so much unconscious symbolism feeding in through the ages that mm -hmm. Kibele, of course, how you call it, this, this, this Greek uh, uh, goddess, she has a lion and she has the fruits and she's goddess of the earth. But I think, and, and fruits and stuff, Bavaria fits right in there. But the problem is people don't see this anymore because they're not educated to this. So it's not, you don't go there and put your libations. You don't put your, you know, your, your, your offerings there anymore. She's just there for a tourist attraction. But in all those times, this would have been a goddess to maybe pray to. People would have gone there and bow down and do something. Well, I still say you pouring your uh, beer on the ground that is a libation to Mother Earth. And so she's not, representing not Mother Earth. But yes, yeah. well, what you're really saying, the beauty of your work is that you're making this evident, you're bringing it to light, and this stuff wouldn't work, in my opinion. You wouldn't have six million people. You wouldn't have this enduring festival. It wouldn't have grown the way that it grew with the rituals it has if it wasn't tapping into these deep uh, currents that we've lived for so many millennia. And you're, and you're tapping and into, like you yeah. say, we're tapping into something so deep and profound within ourselves. And this is where mythology of, of every culture around the world comes up with traditions to surround these functions for these particular aspects it's, to be represented. We need to celebrate the wild in us. We cannot forget the wild nature in us and, uh, and, to, and to let it come and show its face and whether it's so modern fun. day or whether it's we 30 thousand it. years ago we miss that yeah. mystical uh, expression and communion with the earth we miss that ex that communion with the animals we miss nature also there's one thing that i think people in their deep psychology are so uh following their instinct in a way that of, of course the bavaria is standing a little uphill from the oktoberfest with a big staircase there's a stair stairs leading up to it and when the Oktoberfest is over in the evening, this is the one point which does not make it a sacred festival because people get intoxicated and the festival only runs till 11 o'clock. So at 10.30, they give out the last beer. And then people, instead of, you know, if you work up a trance and an ecstatic situation up to the, the climax in a way, what people want is the goddess to appear. So this is the, the, the any reason right. of a, a religious festival is at the point of climax, the highest intoxication, the highest state of ecstasy, the god should appear. You want to unite in the end with the goddess or the god in a way of psychology or spiritually or visually, the god must come down through the ceiling or the priest and make must itself known. The yeah. god image. But the thing is, this is exactly what's missing in the Oktoberfest. There's no God image. There's no priest uh, showing the idol to you. There's no God coming through the scenery down like in Greek theater. What they do is like the beer tapping ends. They turn on the lights and say the festival's over, come back tomorrow. And so the whole thing falls flat into this profane kind of no more beer, no more ecstasy, get to go home now. And people are in a way, either they go home or they're in a way desperate to search for, what am I here for? So sometimes 
this is why they come back the next day to search again. That's what I think. This is why they come again. <laughs> it didn't get the, the divine union with the God because this is what Nietzsche describes and all the uh, uh, anthropologists describe. The divine merging with the God would be the high mm -hmm. uh, goal of the festival. But it's not mm -hmm. religious. After all, it's not religious. So what happens, and it's really funny, and I write this in my book, at the end of the festival, people gather at the feet of the Bavaria statue because they don't mm -hmm. want to go home. They sit there, they bring another beer with them or they bring a little food or it's like after the beer tents close, you still can get food uh, to, to carry around and you still have half an hour on the festival grounds before they shut down everything. So people gather at the Bavaria statue and I write this in this book at the end, waiting for something to happen. It's like unconsciously, there's yeah. got to be something happening now. I'm not merging with the God. I didn't find a spouse. I didn't find a guy to merge. I want the climax of the whole thing. Some climax yeah. going to happen. And they sit there in a way. Sometimes they're singing songs there. Sometimes they repeat the Oktoberfest songs for themselves. So it's like this aftermath of the festival. But it stays profane. There's no... Mm -hmm. Sometimes the goddess glows a little bit at night. I think she's talking to them. Yeah, you know, the statue. <laughs> but it, it's what I experienced. But the thing is, it's not installed as a, a politically you know, by church accepted festival of a divine right. This is the problem. As, as much as they can slip into our secular society. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, people understand, and some people say this is divine. The festival is divine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's touching me deeply in a way of trust and uh, experiencing myself different, but it's not installed like an ancient Greek uh, Dionysian rite or something. This is the point. Yeah. So it stays modern. It stays or we mentioned that ancient Egyptian festival with beer, yes. which has its or mythology, the, bring yeah. out the wild, but then tame it and, you, uh, and around the uh, a goddess of strength segment. Can I jump right back in real quick? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And I want to hear from Leslie. That was the problem Leslie. that Dionysus cult had with the Sibyl cult. Okay, that me. was the issue because the Sibyl cult, the, 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 the cult towards Sibyl did not have that connection with the goddess, I guess you could say that you have the Dionysus cult. They had two completely different versions of uh, with Addis and Sibyl, where there was libations being given or whatever else, right? But that uh, direct connection that you have with the Dionysus cult to see the God at the end of it, to like eventually this this uh, connection to, towards the end, the Sibyl cult didn't have that, all right? And they viewed it as a foreign Greek concept coming from Anatolia, into Rome, and they had a real issue with how she was that to her cult was doing things versus the way the Dionysus cult did it. So I'm not. It, it, I find it. I find it interesting that just what she just described, where at the very end of the festival they go to the the uh, uh, statue of uh, the uh, uh, the Bavarian statue. They sit there and just drink and and basically just sit and stare at the statue at the end of it. But it I just I find that really interesting. All right, I'm, I'm not they saying would it be makes drawn no to the statue. That they need to be drawn to the statue. They, yeah. Yeah. It just, it's, it's very reminiscent of the same theme is what I'm saying. Extremely exactly. reminiscent. But so we're I acting this out, whether we know it or not. We're following. Whether we realize it or not. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I just, it's crazy. And I think there's so anyway, much more you. that goes on in our society that is following <laughs> Thanks, these Cam, old waves. Yeah. 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 So yeah. You could say that basic human nature is searching for the spiritual kind of conditions or situations yeah. unconsciously without knowing. It's like people gather the Bavaria is like a goddess. You feel like you want to sit there and still sing a song to her and feel like some kind of divine climax is supposed to happen. So I think it's a deep, a settled memory that we have or longing for this kind of thing. It's not about the it's beer. Not, it's about the transcendence or the effort yeah, to, to cross. spoken out in the open. I mean, you want to cross the, the magical threshold, encounter the goddess or the gods, and then return. That's the complete cycle. And... Yes. Uh, yeah. And the thing is that, interesting enough, nobody ever looked at the Oktoberfest this way. I mean, I'm, actually, it's interesting. I'm the first person who has dared to interpret the Oktoberfest in a kind of social, psychological, anthropological, spiritual way, which is, was totally new. Because you should keep going. Saw yeah. The yeah. Economy, they saw the economy. They saw the kind of, you know, whatever history. But this kind of spiritual view on these things, it was like uh, people were baffled because they said, oh, okay, look at this. this I think it makes perfect thing. sense. The only way to look I at think it, it's actually. brilliant. Think. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I want to go to Leslie's there in Egypt. Uh, Leslie, we can look at from the Egyptian point of view. I also yeah. want to mention because oh. we have we have Frederick 
uh, Frederick Smith in the room, who's also a Vedic scholar, oh. looking at it from the point of view oh. of the librations and, and offerings. Yeah, I mean, oh, it, welcome but back, we're running. We, no, we can we've go gone over, over time. time, so we're gonna go over time. You, you, yeah, yeah it's hard. It's hard to stop when we get this kind of energy rolling. So, yeah. uh, Leslie, would you like to share? Hi, okay. um, thank you. That was a wonderful, a wonderful presentation. Um, I don't have a lot to add. I mean, I think that um, that Laura Lee already said the Sekhmet story, so that was a significant uh, thing. But um, my what I know about these uh, beverages in ancient Egypt was mainly that they were sacred, and that they weren't, you know, just a food. And and as uh, Brigitta said in the beginning that they usually were infused with something because that was a way to extract plants and things like that. So um, they were used to uh, for different states of ecstasy or or whatever. But um, yeah, and I involved think involved in a ritual. That's the other interesting thing. They were yeah. part of a mass ritual. <laughs> yes. So with yes. A purposeful. To carry and to me, that's that. really interesting that these were not just things to drink, you know, for everybody necessarily to get drunk, but that they were very specifically, they added things to it to, um, for specific reasons. To play out a myth, to play out a, um, a shift in our psychology yeah. to mm -hmm. facilitate yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and see, this was all this all these things with the ecstatic dancing and the ecstatic kind of drink and food were suppressed in the Middle Ages at the latest, you know, because we know that church festivals in the Middle Ages did have like a lot of drink, a lot of wine. And when they did like Easter festivals, the people really drank the wine and they did party and they had yeah. ecstatic dances and church did away with it because it was taking people away from what they thought was the, the line to go, their kind of yeah. control. So even in Christianity, up to the Middle Ages in the Roman period, they had all these things. In Gothic, it still happened. And yeah. then around 12th century, they did away with the ecstatic festivals and dancing around churches. So it's been alive for a long time till church yes. put on the hammer and, and stopped that. Well, we break bread. That's, that's a communal thing. And look what Christianity did. They said, okay, we'll keep the bread and make that the, the wafer, well, uh, the body of the blood of Christ, the body of Christ, you know, put the symbolism right back into it. Could be. And right. keep the ritual. No, but this is a yeah. very important aspect now to say, because this is real. I mean, this is real bread I can break. Mm -hmm. And the beer is a real thing I can drink. The, the Christian church has started doing this very uh, refined in a way. So the bread's a wafer and the drinks a sip of wine or nothing, actually, what do you get? Mm -hmm. So it's not sensual. They took out sensuality out of it. It's only a spiritual ritual that's kind of a... You know, it's more, uh, you know, in the in the ether, it's more like a, area, a gestural you know? language. That it's a gestural. And what yeah. about the Oktoberfest does? It brings back the central thing. You can grab it. You can hold on to it. You can touch it. And I've been a lot to... Joy and abundance are there. Yeah. And I've been a very lot to Indian temples. I've traveled India so many times. And I've been to South India a lot and been to all the <laughs> holy places. And in the South Indian temple, you get real food. They give yeah. you not a wafer. They give you a handful of rice uh, that's cooked. I mean, and they give you flowers, and it's a sensual, touchable kind of a thing in the church, in the temples in India. And this is about what people seek, I think. Right. This is why the Oktoberfest is so important, because they seek this kind of physical, touchable, sensual kind of experience of a community or a divine kind of thing, which is so, in a way, as in, a, in a theory in church. It's very airy. It's very away from the central part. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, you Leslie. Leslie. I'm going to bring up... Oh, you'll you'll enjoy meeting Frederick uh, Smith. Hi there. Yeah, this is very interesting, and you know, of course, Frederick's a Vedic of, scholar. I said that. Yeah, there's a lot of resonances between what goes on in the early Indian literature, the Vedic literature, and you know, and the connections with that on the one hand between what goes on presently, since you've been to India a bunch of times, and um, <clears throat> between uh, the kind of both the festival, the symbolic aspects of it, because the ancient Vedic rituals. There were basically two kinds of like intoxicants that they used, and they were both extremely complicated to manufacture. And um, uh, we don't even know what the identity was of the early soma plant um, or the genre of plants that was considered to be soma. And the other one called sura, sura s u r a, which is more 
<clears throat> more of a kind of a wine. But there, but for example, with the Sura, which was prescribed for a bunch of rituals, but you can see that, I mean, this is a really important distinction that you're making, I think, between the the the, the ritual, religious, symbolic aspect of things on the one hand, and the sensual uh, component on the other. And, you know, as you, as you well point out, that so much of the sensual component has been kind of, you know, extracted out of the, you know, filtered out of the, of the um, use conscious of conscious understanding of conscious understanding and and really and what we what we think we that we could get back to actually is um, a more uh, complete um, sense of of both the spiritual the intellectual you know the the sensual sides of things put them all together and that's what you're saying that that Oktoberfest will do and I, I was there from one Oktoberfest a few years ago I was in Heidelberg. And um, oh, so I did. I did uh, see that maybe a couple times, as a matter of fact. And uh, <laughs> so the, uh, um, but in the Indian sense, I mean, just just the stuff that goes into these things, um, like in this thing called Sura, they will have. I mean, it's it's like it's it's like something that you could never imagine, and I can't even imagine how this stuff tasted. Um, but it would be like you know some milk, some some kind of fermented beverage like they were for the symbolic aspects you'd have a few hairs from a tiger um a um with three animals a tiger maybe a a sheep and a something else like three different kinds of domestic you know, wild and domestic animals um and the idea was of course that there was it, it's not just for symbolic purposes but because these these different substances did possess um, certain qualities that would add actually to the to the beverage itself, uh, not just stand on their own as just something symbolic. But if you put the hair of a tiger into a drink, there's going to be part of the essence of that tiger there, hmm. and that's what they that's what they were there, not just because of the symbolic of strength and wildness or deer, or, you know, mild mannered, you know, sort of semi wild animal. Um, but all of these things, you know, contributed, but it was also part of the whole thought process that went into the, um, into the, um, both the, the performative aspect of things ritually and the celebratory part of it where the, where the, um, uh, sensuality was, was very much included in the imbibing of these things, but there wasn't that big of a separation between the, 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 the sensual parts and the, um, and the um, ritual aspects of it, uh, which was really, you know, pretty interesting, to, you know, to think about it. Were you reading oh. from text, or are there are they still concocting these today and carrying out so, the full ritual? They're still concocting it in a couple, of, in a few little parts of India. I've seen it um, a few times, um, and you know, people from different communities. India is a very socially socially complicated place. Um, so, and within these rituals, there is aspects to. Uh, Kind of bring in some of this social complication, um, which I see Vijay Gupta here. So I, uh, she knows about the social complications of India. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, Indira, all I have to say is all these things is used as a base to develop the five senses, so we can evolve to the sixth sense, which is inherent in all of us. So all this stuff is gearing to develop the sixth sense so there is no separation between the Brahman and yourself at every level. Thank you. Yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, that is beautiful. Thank you, Andrew. I want to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll look yeah. forward to further discussions. And Frederick, thank you again for all So it's about yeah, the yeah, transcendence, really. going from Brahman to or self to Brahman, going from small self to a larger community whether it's energetically or with a physical community of various other humans or the spirits. That's about transcendence. And we have well, a present. Yeah. yeah. There's, uh, can I say one thing to this? Because sure, of course. Please, yeah. I am, I, I, of course, I researched into the idea about living in a Catholic kind of piece of land here. The, the, the Bavarians in Southern Bavaria are very Catholic, Northern Bavaria is very Protestant in a way. So I grew up in a Protestant area moving down here. And it's very different in the way they approach uh, their kind of church service and religion. So the Oktoberfest in a way is what uh, 
Mrs. Gupta just said it's very much this kind of sensual event. You know, it's like the ecstatic trance in a very sensual way. You dance, you touch, you drink, you break the bread, all these yes. things. Yes. It's, so you can get to a divine kind of point of a, a trance and ecstasy, I think, through this dancing, trance-like, what we do kind of stuff, uh, the effective ritual that you do. And a lot of people I experience in Christian church over here, especially in the Protestant part even more, is they try to do it by extent, uh, by a kind of ascetic kind of ways, you know. They try to reach a trance by listening to the word and going more into the in the less kind of sensual thing. They try to go into the 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 mind kind of condition and the ether kind of intellect. Condition. Exactly. Into intellect, right? In the word, it's like the word is the truth and things like this, which is also true. But this is why people have such a longing to celebrate a thing like the Oktoberfest because they need the five senses, they need this physical kind of experience, which church has taken out of its, uh, you know, is it out, out of its services. They now slowly come back because they feel people are going away out of churches. They're leaving the church here because it's too boring in a way and not adequate anymore. Right. And I've even seen like Protestant priests who try to work with the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air to do something like this, a little shamanist of it on top of it, because mm -hmm. people run away from church in a way because it's too theoretic in a way. Mm -hmm. And the Oktoberfest is so much physical that I think people enjoy the Bring it back into the body. Right, exactly. Yeah, the physiological the aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Frederick. And uh, by the way, Frederick did a presentation here previously, uh, uh, Trance States in Ancient India. It's on our website, so you should go check that out. Thank you, Frederick. We, we need gonna, more we from you, talk Frederick. Hey, I, that. I have to look it up. Nice meeting you. I, yeah. I, I, thank you, Frederick. Bye. I want to talk to somebody who is your friend who attended Oktoberfest. Robert, you want to say something? Yeah, Robert, let's hear from you. Um, we don't know where don't you are. don't have a lot to say except there you are. Brigitte has uh, fascinating stories about, I mean, I, I was reading between the things that she was saying, all the stories she's told me about the history and about the, especially about the ritual of the festival over the years. I've probably been 10 times or so with her uh, around the Wiesen and um, she's just a, a wealth of knowledge about everything that goes on there. Do I have any insights beyond what she said? Not really. Other than it's the camaraderie, the gemuchlichkeit is something that once you experience it, you can't forget it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but I have to say something about Robert. This is what I really was fascinating me. There's two types of people experiencing Oktoberfest. I go there and I move around a lot. So I go to the beer table, I have maybe a, a mug, and then I go on and move to the next table, and then I go outside the tent and inside the tent. I'm more like searching and looking. Robert is one of these guys, like what Bavarians do, which I never will forget. I said, it's so great. <laughs> he said, bring me to the Oktoberfest, put me on a table, and he's sitting there. And then he lets the world go by. And I thought it's so fascinating. Yeah. When, uh, and I had to go away and I said, sit there in the spirit and enjoy yourself. I came back six hours later, he was still there at the same table. <laughs> All the people around him had changed. So he says, I don't need to move. <laughs> well, that's, the, that's the, one of the great things about this is I've always found just on my own, uh, even when she's not with me, is that you sit at a table with strangers and within an hour or so, they're your new best friends. Exactly. You have their names in your phone book and you're taking pictures with them and you know their <laughs> relationships, where they're from. Sometimes they're from other countries. Sometimes they're barbarians. Mm -hmm. And you learn all sorts of things. Brigitte and I sat at a table with a guy who was in the Wehrmacht in, in World War II. It was very strange. Uh, and here's this guy. He's in his 80s. And he had some stories. And uh, you, you get be, you bond with them. This bonding thing that comes happens almost in, instantaneously is unique in any sort of situation. It's not like sports. It's not like any other thing. It's unique to the Oktoberfest. And it's Thank amazing you, when the ice is yeah. broken, how we can make fast friends. I'm bold. I just go up and start talking to anybody. And it's interesting sure. what what they'll tell strangers yeah. uh, when you ask about spontaneous mystical experiences. Too much, too much information. Philosophy of yeah, life yeah. and all of that. People want to share and uh, maybe just need an excuse. So, thank, thank you, But Robert. to do it on a communal scale, yeah. that's yeah. extraordinary. That kind yeah. of uh, yeah. egregory, that kind of, uh, yeah, expansion. It's an expansion of the heart and the senses and joy. This and is how to we... share it, it becomes, mm. there's power in numbers. 
Yeah. And this is how we hang out with Brigitte. It goes on for hours, but <laughs> we are going to bring this to an end. Brigitte, I want to thank you so much. It's a fantastic presentation. You've brought forth so much information. It's not available anywhere else but through groundbreaking. you. Groundbreaking. It's groundbreaking research. And uh, we're so pleased and honored that you would choose us to share your work with. And of course, before we end, we need to yodel. <laughs> can, you, oh my God. can you do a yodel? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see the fear. I try my best. <laughs> uh, okay, let's try this. I did have a cold last week, so I try to do it in spite of the cold. Okay. No judgment. Show yeah. off your dirndl once again because Do you know those, those designers of old knew something. So, yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. So you have, you can have this kind of um, you know thing with it or not. So this is like from the back. My the light's too bright, isn't it? The light is funky. I'm sorry. You see this? This is you yeah. have the the bow on the left side, and uh, you know it's kind of a little apron with it. So it makes you look like a little princess. This is why we <laughs> tend to wear this. It brings out your female attributes and it makes you look like a princess. This is why people enjoy this. <laughs> I have and, uh, photographs uh, of my Swiss ancestors in Dernals and Lederhosen. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to say to Robert, I haven't seen him in a long time. You're looking really good, actually. I mean, I haven't seen Robert in such a long time. Yeah. Years, so nice yeah. to see you. That's great. Hopefully really next year. It. Hopefully next year I'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully next year we do the Oktoberfest together. This is what everybody's here hoping for, that the festival will come back. Yeah. Because the city is not the same without it. People have, they miss the company, they miss the joy. So it's kind mm -hmm. of been a really strange kind of situation doing it without um, all these guests from abroad. But what I did, because I can't let go of the Oktoberfest, I took some friends and we went over there on the first day and we opened just our little beer bottles and we were only three people with beer bottles in front of the Bavaria. And there was nothing there. It was a sunny day. It was nothing there. And more and more people came. So in the end, oh, my, my lamps are flying away here. So in the end, it was like 40 people drinking beer and having fun in front of the Bavaria. And oh. we, stayed, we stayed there for six hours drinking beer and having fun. <laughs> On this kind of picnic kind of situation and said, this is our little Oktoberfest now. This was the starting this year. We did the party yeah. in front of the Bavaria. It was fun. So Bavaria well, is still holding up the tent pole. We'll have to come there and you're yeah. going to have to come back to the Institute again too. So we'll get back we need together. a trip in September yeah. to go experience it with, yeah. with Brigida. Thank you so, so much, Brigida. Thank you. And thank you Brilliant. all for attending. And what I'm going to do... I want to hear from Frederick and Indira and more on, on Vedic philosophy. We want to get to know the world and all of its ritual, all of its ancient wisdom, all of the traditions that make this beautiful tapestry. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been fun on these yeah. Sundays to start weaving in. I think next Sunday we've got the tracker, which is a very ancient oral tradition that uh, Alex van der Hever is making alive from South Africa, <laughs> South Africa working yeah. with some of the last remaining Bushman trackers, yeah. creating an academy wow. for it to really understand, again, how our ancestors operated in their world. That's... They were all expert trackers at one time, if you dial back history far enough. And I, I just love these revival of these ancient bodies of knowledge to really celebrate our ancestors and, and celebrate, um, to pull I'm, back, to aim forward uh, in truer. And you know, that really I'm kind sure. of fulfills the mission of the Institute following in the footsteps of Dr. Goodman, being able to not only follow the, the research into ecstatic trance states themselves, but looking at worldwide ritual and understanding the foundation of, 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 of indigenous people both European and, and all. To aspects. keep that part of us alive. Right, yeah. right. exactly. Brigitte, you had one last word? No, I just saw that also Katie is there, Kathleen, she lives in Munich. I haven't seen her because the picture's so dark. Kathleen Henke, she's there, she lives in Munich and I met her on the Oktoberfest so many years ago. Uh, Hello. <laughs> did I get the right person? Hi, yes. Kathy. Yeah. Hi, Kathy, oh, you're very hi. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to get in the mood.
of it. <laughs> I have a lot of nice memories. I live in a village. I don't live in Munich. And so um, I live uh, within 25 minutes of the Oktoberfest. So it's typical that I will just go there maybe 10 times, um, rarely to drink, but just to roam around and take in the atmosphere. And mm -hmm. there is really an atmosphere. You have something like the Oktoberfest, which on one hand is a big moneymaker. On another hand, it's a place where foreigners get drunk. But in between <laughs> that, in between that, there is this uh, pervasive feeling of... Um, old, old patterns and rituals, because we're human beings, and we need that. And there's so many times that I've stood out on the uh, fairway at the bottom of the steps where the uh, Bavaria is, with people milling and matting around and all sorts of different colors, dresses and um, dirndls and later hosen and balloons and funny animals that they won and things like that all around me. And I look up and there is the statue, the goddess, <laughs> benignly, benignly blessing all our little bits of human joy and attempts of spirituality. Beautifully said. Wow. Well, Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, beautifully put. And I want to say I can't begrudge the civic logistics and the profit margin of all the people and the businesses that make it happen. Right. And I'm quite sure that in ancient Egypt or ancient Samaria, when they were having their communal festivals featuring the beer and the bread, that there was a practicum. There was a uh, logistics. There were the tradespeople that had to be paid. There were the farmers that had to be. There was profit to to reward the people who did all the work so, um and i think it had its secular aspects as well just to get it going yeah. um and to think about all the preparation that goes into this um and even uh the kwa kwa kawak chief randy cook talking about yeah. the logistics and prep that goes into their pot latches, oh, the pot latches yeah. so you know to thank those people and mm -hmm. celebrate that sure. um as well and I just want to say, um, I love the Nietzsche and that Thank you, you quoted. And those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. So it's all about opening our ears, opening our bandwidth and hearing the call of the spirits and uh, to ride those waves of transcendence, however we have found to do it, to, to be truly a citizen of the cosmos and to enlarge our, enlarge our experience of being human and commune with the whole web of life. I think that's what it's all about here. So bring in the lions, bring in the cows, bring Thank in the- Thank you, Brigitte. The bring grains. in the cows, right? Yeah. Bring in the cows. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Bring in the hearts, bring in the yeah. yeah. Open the heart to our fellow man and men and women, so. Thank you. This has been so Thank much fun. Thank you so fun. much, Brigitte. It's our way of celebrating so Oktoberfest. 